All right. And we will admit everyone. Great. I had to fix, I mean, I broke things trying to get this set up today. So hopefully we have a better meeting. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope it was nothing significant or, and also nothing on your body. No, it, it was something that mattered to me, but I have to let it go. It was this cool vase I had from my mother, but <clears throat> yeah, what can I do? Stupid COVID. It's COVID's fault. Perfect answer. Okay. I think everyone is in, so we are ready when you are. All right, we will now start. This meeting of the Livingston City Commission is called to order. May we have roll call, please? Chair Hogland? Yes. Commissioner Schwartz? Present. Commissioner Friedman? Present. Commissioner Maybe? Here. Commissioner News? Here. Next on our agenda, we will have public comments. Please be reminded that public comments should be uh address addressing issues that are not further on the agenda um as well as items that we have supervision control jurisdiction and advisory power do we have any public comment at this time please oh a couple things please put your name in the chat if you'd like or just speak up if um or wait for a moment to speak up when it is a turn, but chat is definitely easier so we know to not miss you. <clears throat> Any public comment? Okay, we will move on. Uh, next, we have consent items. We have three consent items tonight. We have consent items A, B, and C. Do we have any motion from the commission on consent items A, B, and C, or any that you would like pulled for uh, discussion? Do we have Probably a motion? motion. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion by Quentin. Do we have a second? I make a motion uh, that we pass concerns A, B, and C. Okay, so we have actually Quentin had the motion and uh, Mel Friedman has I'll second. Second. I'll second. Roll call, please. Chair Hoagland? Yes. Commissioner Schwartz? Four. Commissioner Friedman? Four. Commissioner Maybe? Four. Commissioner News. Four. Motion passes. Tonight we have no proclamations. We have no scheduled public comment. We do have three public hearings. Our first public hearing is ordinance number 2084. Or sorry, not sure. Just real quick, if you don't mind, I would suggest maybe move an action item A to the front so that um, the cham chamber doesn't have to wait through the entire. Um, agenda to get to that action item. Um, you're right. And I had moved it in my agenda, but the arrow didn't move far enough. So thank you. <laughs> We're, if everyone's okay with that, could we please move the action items to the top of the agenda before our public hearings? Everyone? Okay. Okay? All right. So Tonight we have two action items. First action item is to discuss approved deny Livingston Chamber of Commerce e waiver request for 2020 downtown Christmas stroll. <laughs> Thank you uh, for having me on here tonight. I appreciate your time this evening. Um, uh, you know, basically, you've all seen the letter and also the rules that uh, we have written, the stroll plan that we have um, discussed with Dr. Desnick and the health department. Uh, we have also discussed them with the downtown businesses. Um, we did not get all the way to the third block yet, to be honest with you, but they did all receive a uh, email. Um, 
but the other than a couple of businesses that had uh, concerns over um, how many people came in their businesses, um, the overall response was that uh, many of the stores were going to be doing something on their own if we didn't do this. So the gate, I guess, uh, getting that out of the way, um, you know, it's been a long time tradition of having the Christmas stroll. Uh, many years ago, when I came on as the director, I tried to make it safer by closing the streets. And that was a new aspect about seven years ago, I believe. And um, since then, um, not only have we not seen any incidences, but it has been a, a wonderful event for our local community. Um, this year, again, as everything is different and we have safety concerns in major places, um, you know, we had to look at this and say, how can we still continue to support the economy um, during Christmas time and still continue the tradition, but yet look at it as a safer um, faction of, uh, to make it happen. And so, first of all, we started with Santa. You know, gosh knows we all still um, look forward to Santa coming down our main street every year. And we have, as always, planned about 400 of the gifts that get handed out by Santa, as we know, and um, have learned with many other chambers, not only around the state, but around the United States. Um, you know, what is the way that we do this? Uh, what is the, the safest way of making this happen? Obviously, children don't sit on Santa's lap. We thought about putting him in a plexiglass box. We thought about many other ways of trying to um, have this happen. And we thought that we would just leave Santa on the wagon. So we would park him in the middle of Main Street and leave him on the wagon. Uh, we normally have Frosty the snowman at Sarah Schofield's. Frosty is going to come join Santa on the wagon. And um, up to this point, we had to think about we couldn't just do this at night. So that caused a lot of the density and talking with Dr. Desnick and the holiday um, committee that we um, had a couple of weeks back, what was a couple of the other safer ways of making this potentially happen? Um, one would be that um, closing the streets would be great. Uh, actually one of the major things that would be closing the streets. So this would cause less crowding on the sidewalks. Um, number two would be um, again, the, the closeness of Santa to any of the children or families. Uh, number three would be asking each of the businesses not to have drinks and food inside their stores so that it wouldn't cause a mass gathering inside of the stores. Um, at this point, all stores and businesses have agreed to that. Um, also, uh, you know, by having it out in the street, um, starting it earlier in the day. So that would be starting at two o'clock in the afternoon and going till eight o'clock at night. So stopping earlier was something that Dr. Desnick felt was um, something that would be, you know, um, that would also cause less of a mass gathering. Um, starting it at two o'clock in the afternoon would allow parents with younger children to come even earlier. Uh, it would also spread out the event. So less mass gathering, as you know, the event usually takes place at five, goes to eight, and everybody packs in there um, in that three hour period. So this would also mean moving it from Friday night to Saturday. So then this creates our new Christmas stroll for this year um, with adaptions. That would be Saturday, December 5th from 2 to 8 p.m. Closing the streets and the alley exits. Um, this would uh, also, it's a mask required event. Um, the booth that we are talking about down there, I think it's like number six or seven, WSE's farmers um, ha harvest market, excuse me, that normally takes place at the Civic Center was told that that just wasn't going to happen. There's too many people inside of a, you know, big enclosed building. So WSE is asked to have some of their vendors, not all of them, um, some are going to pass for the year, but a large amount of them would like to join us. And so their booths would be placed in the center of Main Street, back to back, spread out by at least 10 feet. These are not the type of booths you walk inside of. These are the booths you walk up to. So again, that doesn't cause you to be inside of a small enclosed location. Um, uh, I think that would be all of the items that were on the list. The other thing that Dr. Desnick brought up was making sure that we, you know, passed out masks. Uh, in talking with Molly from the health department, she, um, you know, I asked her to help us find a few volunteers to even ensure that and maybe even herself to join us. Um, so, uh, you know, between us and the um, 
the directors of the board directors, they would also be helping hand out the masks and uh, be positioned at both the top and the bottom and throughout the Christmas roll. Um, so that pretty much covers it. We have um, asked this year uh, that the city be a um, sponsor by covering the cost of the street closures. Um, as every year, once the street closures go up at noon, the vendors would be able to set up their, their um, booths. Uh, we'd be able to bring Santa in about three o'clock. And um, then at the end of the evening, since it's a Saturday, we simply pull the closures off to the corners like we've done every year. And then the, um, the street crews are able to pick them up on Monday morning. So um, this would be a very uh, easy doable event throughout the day. And I'm asking the commission at this time to approve um, not only the waiver for the street closure fees um, as a sponsor, um, but also as a um, in good faith for uh, having our annual Christmas stroll. Um, and the last part I just wanted to throw out, I forgot about was that annually, normally we um, market this event uh, to statewide and we are going to curb back and not do that this year. We are gonna keep it more of a local advertisement like we did um, with the Halloween, uh, the evening for Halloween. So, so there you go. All right. Um, um, Michael, first of all, could we start with, uh, did the city have any recommendation on, on the, the stroll in general? I'm sorry, should on the what in general? The stroll. Um, no, we just recommended contacting the health department, which the chamber has done, um, and make sure they're following any any guidance from the health department. Uh, the, the chamber did provide us a letter today from the health department. I didn't have time to get it out to all of you. I can share it if you'd like to see it, uh, but it just says uh, that they've received the proposal and they feel it follows the phase two guidelines. Okay. All right. Um, how about if we open it to public? Uh, comment first, which we normally do. Uh, why don't we open it to public comment? And if you have a comment, please put it, your name in the chat and uh, we'll go from there. Any public comment on the P waiver for the Christmas stroll? So am I unmuted? Yeah, go ahead. This is Patricia Grabo. I'm on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce. I uh, really appreciate uh, this being put on the agenda for the city commission tonight. Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone into this. As you know, I'm, I don't know if you know, but I'm very conservative in terms of protecting citizens during a, a COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, I had a grandfather who died in the flu epidemic of 1918 in Livingston, Montana. So I'm, I'm one of those people that wears my mask all the time and, and follows whatever guidelines there are. And I just think the chambers worked hard still to retain the tradition of the Christmas stroll. I just talked to my grandchildren who were, you know, kind of facing Christmas with some sadness um, because we can't quite have the family gatherings that we had once, we always have. Um, so I just think this is a, uh, I appreciate the work of Dr. Desnick on a regular basis anyway. And I think this is a really wonderful effort by this community through this pandemic to be safe and still be able to celebrate this uh, wonderful event for our community. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Darrell, this is Michelle Ubaraga, uh, 7-Eleven, Lock Laven. I just wanted, to, just wanted to thank the chamber for, you know, kind of their very extra 
careful precautions that they're taking this year and making sure they're coordinating with the health department. I, I'm um, really thrilled to hear that report. So thanks so much, Leslie, for doing that. Thank you, Michelle. Any other public comment? Okay. I wanna just double check, make sure. <clears throat> Jarrell, it's Michelle. One, one more point that just uh, uh, came to mind is if the chamber needs help with masks that Park County Environmental Council, we've been working with our volunteers to sew masks and um, would be happy to help distribute free masks to community members for the Christmas drill. Thanks again, Michelle. All right. It doesn't look like there's any other public comment. Um, move it to commissioners. Any questions, comments, commissioners? Yeah, Darrell. Yeah, go ahead, Mel. Um, I had a call from one of the businesses on Main Street, uh, a restaurant, concerned with the fact that uh, there's going to be an awful lot of traffic uh, that they don't normally have that's going to be coming towards them. Uh, and they're so diligent in their own operation of keeping it clean. And people have the habit of, you know, they might have to go to a restroom or something and they come in and uh, they just lose control. And uh, that was their biggest concern is just having an awful lot of people in the area and of trying to take care of the inside portion of the business uh, it gets to be a little bit, a uh, little bit rough doing that. So I could understand uh, what the person was saying. Uh, it just presents uh, a, another problem that they don't normally have. And uh, that, that's my remark. Thank you, Mel. Um, other commissioners. This is uh, Commissioner Schwartz. Go ahead, Quentin. Um, yeah, I, same concern was brought to me as far as uh, public restrooms and stuff. As um, Matt, of course, we don't have any public restrooms down there. Um, just any thoughts on you know portable toilets? Um, I'm trying to think of what we've done in the past. Uh, I don't remember portable toilets before down there either as well. Um, it's something that I, I think needs to be addressed, uh, um, at least for this year, perhaps, because, um, you know, having to sanitize everything, you know, when people come and going in bathrooms and, uh, and the like. So, um, it's a legitimate concern that needs to be addressed. Thank you. I yield. All right. Thank you, Quentin. Other commissioners? Warren or Melissa? I can. Go ahead, yes. Melissa. So I also have only received um, negative feedback about a Christmas stroll. Um, I don't know, commissioners, if you saw that we got an email today. Um, I'll let you check your emails if you have your iPad, but it was from the business improvement district. And so it's a pretty long email, but it's basically <laughs> contradicting some of the things that Leslie said in terms of business owners, um, their opinions on a stroll. So I think, and also concerns about having um, the holiday markets set up outside of their businesses when the businesses pay rent and taxes for those areas in the holiday market obviously is something different. So that's a challenging topic because I don't know that that's exactly falls within our jurisdiction, but I do think it's important in terms of like, how can we help? I, there needs to be some more communication, it seems like to me, to get folks on the same page because I'm not sure if everybody's heard the plan that the chamber came up with. And I um, echo 
you know, the appreciation for the chamber being so thoughtful about what, what could be, what's possible, like thinking about what's possible and trying to be creative in these really challenging times. So, um, so that's my concern, I guess. Durrell is like, I'm not sure that everybody's on the same page and there's some a clearly not clear communi communication across the business community right now. And I wonder if it wouldn't be helpful to allow some more time for these folks to get together um, to share information, to see if that would help business owners be more comfortable or not. I also would like to see that letter that we have not seen from Michael. I don't know if he wants to put it on the screen or send us an email from the health department. Um, so that's another concern I have is that we don't all have that information. Um, well, there you go. Thanks for that. So I, under, I mean, I understand like it's similar, like Halloween we shifted and there's some similar concerns to Halloween, but also it's a very different kind of event from than Halloween, the way people are dispersed. So um, I don't know. I, I just, I guess I wanted to make sure that you all knew that there was, it's not unified positive feedback. In fact, all the feedback we've gotten has been negative. And it's not necessarily about whether we should waive fees about, it's more about should this even happen during a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Quentin, I mean, not Quentin, I'm sorry. Warren, do you want to say anything? Yeah, um, I think the um, the real question is is a uh, it's a as the person put it uh, in her comment uh, the risk reward uh, if all the guidelines are followed um, that would be great uh, I have very serious doubts that they would be uh, we've all been in Costco or Town and Country or Albertsons and people. Um, are walking around without masks. Um, and a lot of the smaller stores or the, um, the restaurants, um, even with, uh, you know, a number on the door for how many people can be in the room at the same time, uh, I have serious doubts that it will be followed. Um, I don't mean to be a pessimist, but this, this whole mask thing has gotten to be, uh, uh, totally uh, out of control. It, it seems to have gotten a, a life of its own. Um, so at this point, we're just voting on whether to waive the fees. And I would go ahead with that. Um, I would not include anything at this point of, uh, of sponsoring it beyond that or being in favor of it. Uh, I think we'll know better. Um, the way things are going um, a week or two from now in terms of, of if it's getting better or worse. Um, and again, the idea of risk reward um, uh, is, 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 should be considered. Uh, there are traditions and I'm a big believer in them. Um, I just don't know that uh, that at this particular time, uh, missing one, one year um, and doing, and I believe it was mentioned doing it differently by spreading the, uh, spreading it out over a month rather than a two or three or four hour period um, would be beneficial. So I think if we just leave it at voting for the waiver, um, that would let things progress and then see what happens a week or two from now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warren. So uh, if, if I was to go into, you know, the variety of things and concerns I have, it could take a while, but um, I'll try to keep it to the point. Um, I know tonight we are making a decision on one issue and it is something that we have to often redirect our own selves within our commission meetings back to the issue, which is a fee waiver. Um, 
and that's one issue like and warren thank you for helping uh start that part of the conversation um i do struggle with the I feel like the protocols are not very clear and, and direct mm -hmm. and concrete as someone who has to plan procedures and protocols daily, if not, or weekly, if not daily. Um, I'm just uncomfortable with kind of the, the list isn't thorough enough for me for safety. Um, that's just one of the things out. And I know um, also another worry is, I mean, it was stated tonight that, you know, families can't seem to gather the same, but then we could potentially have 500 people in our in a three block area. That's a concern. Um, but I think what we're really down to is is this um, is this fee waiver something we'll approve or not? Uh, so what I would like to see, and I'm going to propose it to you guys, and then you can uh, see it the same way or make a different motion. I would like to consider tabling it, the fee waiver request. And, um, you know, the event isn't, this isn't, we're not approving an event. Um, but I think tabling it and giving more time to everyone to work together. Because again, we didn't have a lot of information before. To, um, then we can we consider the e waiver um, at the next meeting. And there is still time for the chamber to do their work, the community to do their work and work together to, and the downtown to work together to uh, decide how they're going to implement the stroll. But like I said, I have concerns on the pr protocols in particular and the lack of statement of that master mandatory that was not stated but it was stated in that letter we just saw that michael shared um having that the county uh, health department had stated that but it was not in the original um so that's my idea is that we table the um the actual fee waiver or we can approve it and i agree with what um warren said I'm not comfortable being a sponsor as the as the city or cities can at this time until more details are worked out. Any thoughts, commissioners? I think there's plenty of time, Darrell. Like you said, if because Leslie said December fifth, sat that's a Saturday, so we'll have another meeting before then. Um, so I think putting on another agenda and giving people more time in the business community to get on the same page and whatever precision you're looking for in the protocols. Um, one thing, you know, one thing I would also include is like, in, in addition to this idea of like protocol is if, if someone is, you know, hosting an event and they're going to make a certain behavior mandatory um, there needs to be some sort of enforcement typically for that behavior. So, you know, usually it's like, you must stay at the event with your table until closing time or whatever, you can't pack up early. And if you break this rule X, Y, and Z are the consequences. So if the chamber is requiring mandatory, um, masks to be mandatory, then, then that's one of those things that business owners have come to us about was they don't want to be policing people for masks because they already have to do that. So who would be, who would be making, enforcing these rules? So that's the only other thing that comes to mind that might be helpful for some of those businesses, but that's also, I think a conversation that needs to happen between those parties since that's not our jurisdiction. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think there's some interesting things that came in this letter that we didn't discuss. Warren touched on them. So I think that there's the possibility to still have a great holiday season for Livingston, no matter, you know, any and all events that happen. But I do think it would be great if some of these groups could get together and talk more. Thank you, Melissa. Um, just another key point, And we can then move forward. And is I 
you know, I'm not sure what plans are for bathrooms and that we have to think about that, you know, as a city and how, um, you know, businesses and, and, and the city's support or what we'll need to do more of or help with, I guess. Um, there's also, what's the plan for warmth if the weather turns and it's, you know, 10 degrees, people tend to go into the businesses and then that means gatherings and, and then that's an issue in itself. So I feel like there's a lot of unanswered um, questions, but I think that the real, issue here that we have to decide on the fee waiver, but I, I would like to make a motion that we table the fee waiver request until the next meeting and then for consideration. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second by Warren or me. Yes. Roll call, please. Chair Hoagland. Yes. Commissioner Schwartz. Four. Commissioner Freeman? Four. Commissioner Maybe? Four. Commissioner Newts? Four. Motion passes. Thank you. Now we do have another agenda on, item on for action items. Should we put that back to the back? I did state both, but I, I did want us to be able to address this for Leslie and for um, chamber members that were involved so that if they wanted to. Um, so we will move back to our regular agenda in order. And so we're moving on to public hearings. Um, tonight we have three like stated and our first one is ordinance number 2094 an ordinance of the city commission of the city of Livingston, Montana amending section 30 Point one three of the Livingston Municipal Code entitled Official Zoning Map of the City of Livingston by rezoning a 2,250 square foot parcel described as Livingston, Minnesota, Minnesota? Okay, I think that means Montana. Triangle piece south of block 48, um, border or bounded by Chinook and K Street from medium density residential residential mo mobile home R2 R um, MH to industrial industrial two. That was a lot. All right, so Michael, we'll pass that one on to you for description. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So actually it is Minnesota. It's the Minnesota subdivision. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> which is why it says that, but yes, it isn't in Minnesota. It is here in Montana. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you so you can see exactly where we're talking about first in cadastral. So hold on just a second. Um, there we go. So you can see the little tiny blue triangle here is what we're talking about. Um, that's, the, that's why it's only uh, 2,250 square feet. Um, it's pretty small. It's right on the edge of the rail yard. You can see it's right on one of the spur lines. Um, I'll kind of give you an idea of what the surrounding area looks like. A lot of it is undeveloped. Some of it is uh, auto shops and other industrial uses. Um, this particular area right here is where the county stores the tires that they collect from their storage program. Here is our park. Um, uh, and I think this, this is where the incinerator was. So that kind of gives you a feel for which property we're talking about. And then let me show you, uh, did that switch over to the zoning map? Okay, so this is the current zoning map in that area. The orange areas are all industrial and the green areas are R2 mobile home. Um, so you can see this one is, has industrial kitty corner from it as well as all along its boundary with the rail yard. Uh, so that is uh, why the staff believe that this isn't a significant change to the land use for this area. Um, obviously that, that parcel isn't large enough to uh, place a house on and still be uh, in code. So um, rezoning it to industrial not only is consistent with the neighborhood, but allows use of the, um, allows use of the lot that currently could not be maintained. So we are uh, recommending this and this also came through the, uh, the Zoning Commission, which I believe also approved it um, unanimously. And with that, I will stand by for any questions. All right, well, let, 
let's open the public hearing first. And, uh, and then we can have public give comments and then any questions and comments from the commission after. So this public hearing is now open on ordinance number 2094. Any public comment on ordinance number 2094? I don't see any in the chat. Right. This public hearing is now closed on ordinance number 2094. Commissioners, any questions or comments to Michael? I have a couple questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, first, thank you for pulling up the map because I was it's just really helpful and I was having a hard time finding this. So, so it's R2 mobile home to the north east and it looks like that's a body shop, right? And there might be some residential housing on that property also. And then what is the property just to the northwest? Is that also R2 or is that R2 mobile home? That is also our two mobile home. And what is that? Is that somebody's house right there? I think it is a residence, but I think there's also a business that's run out of that residence. Um, but I think it is a residence. Uh, I don't know if Jim's on somewhere, but he might be able to answer that question. So I guess what's on my mind, and I, I suspect that Jim or Matthew has thought about this um, and can rattle off numbers in a way that I can't, but I'm, um, so industrial allows a lot of uses, like maybe things that people really don't wanna live next to. Um, but I'm wondering with the size of that lot, if the things that I'm thinking of would even be physically able to be built because of building codes. Like, I don't know if you can build a building that small and run like, I don't know, uh, what's the thing called where they, they grow animals, <laughs> like a kennel or a cattery. Um, a kennel or a cattery or like a medical marijuana facility. I'm just thinking like, what are the things that would be most controversial? But that mm -hmm. size lot, would that even be big enough to build those things? No. I mean, without like a variance request or something? No. Michael, you're on mute. There, that might be better. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it would absolutely take some variances. They could maybe do um, some commercial uses in the industrial, uh, but any use that could be put on there could much more easily be put kitty corner across the street. So okay. those residents are already surrounded by industrial where any of those uses could be put. Um, this is just a very small addition to that. Okay. And is he planning, like is he, it sounds like that the owner wants to do, I don't know, like trailer storage or something like for rafting. Um, are they talking about like a deed restriction on that property with it or anything like that would that would be helpful for us to know? No, this would just be a straight zone change, but you are correct that they are looking to use it mainly for trailer storage for drift boats. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, Darrell, that that's all the questions off the top of my head right now. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, other commissioners, do you have any questions? Yeah, Darrell, this is Mel. Go ahead, Mel. I took a look at the property. Uh, what he wants to do with it is, is perfect for that. You, you really want to get to that property, you really have to go something that it's just very low traffic up there, so. Um, I think, I think it's okay. Thank you, Mel. Anyone else? Uh, this is Jim Berg. Um, at our hearing, uh, the question was asked whether any of the neighbors objected to this zoning change and there were no objections. All right, thank you, Jim. All right, 
Um, I don't have a lot of questions. I've already asked them. I asked this week. So um, if no one else has a question or anything, um, do we have a motion from the commission? I move we approve uh, ordinance 2094. I'll second. second. <laughs> by maybe and a second by Schwartz. Roll call, please. Mr. Hoagland? Yes. Commissioner Schwartz? Four. Commissioner Friedman? Four. Commissioner Maybe? Four. Commissioner Newts? Four. Sorry. Motion passes. All right. Next on our agenda, we have ordinance number 2090, an ordinance of the city commission of the city of Livingston, Montana, amending article seven, chapter 30 of the Livingston Municipal Code entitled zoning as it pertains to accessory dwelling units. Mr. Cardis. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is the second reading of this ordinance. Um, it comes before you almost entirely as it was before, but I do want to share um, on page 75 of your agenda, the change we talked about and you had requested uh, to see what that would look like. That is now incorporated in section 30.43C. And that was the, um, the issue we were talking about square footage uh, size of the ADUs. And so this is just a representation of what that code would look like if we didn't have separate restrictions. So it just basically says, um, oh, actually, I don't think it actually did get changed. Never mind. Um, yes, so I guess that's still the original, original wording. So that's fine. Uh, we just changed that to say, um, that accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed 800 square feet. If we were gonna make the change, we would make it um, right in the middle of the second sentence uh, where it starts accessory dwellings and then just the rest of it would remain the same. Uh, can you highlight it right on accessory? Right there, right. So that is exactly where we change. We just capitalize the A and then that would be um, how we would change that if we didn't have a restriction for um, lots under 7,000 square feet. Uh, other than that, the rest of the ordinance remains as it was written. Um, again, it allows accessory dwelling units um, in our residential areas, except for R3, uh, and um, would allow either up to 800 square feet or up to 600 square feet if we kept that restriction in. Um, there is not a residency requirement included in the current uh, draft. So if you wanted that, you would have to add it. And other than that, I will stand by for specific questions on this ordinance. All right. Um, let's open it to public comment on ordinance number 2090. Uh, any public comments on ordinance number 2090? <laughs> Any public comment? Sorry, I didn't see anything in the chat. Hi, uh, Jonathan Hedinger, 519 West Park Street. Um, I just wanted to comment that I was um, a little confused about the process of this. I thought it was gonna go back to the zoning commission, but then it didn't. Um, and so I was just, I went to the zoning commission meeting to learn more and hear more about it. But again, I just kind of wanted to reiterate my comments um, that I think it would be beneficial to consider um, a, um, how this would impact vacation rentals and um, also just p potentially having a ownership requirement, um, ownership residency requirement and at least one of the residents is, but yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Are you saying, 
can I just ask you to clarify because you cut out a tiny bit? Um, you're, what are you saying about the resident ownership? Um, I thought that it would be beneficial um, to consider having that um, as a requirement that uh, the resident would live either in the primary residence or the other one in order to make sure that we aren't just increasing the number of vacation rentals in our town. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other co public comment? Okay, um, commissioners, any public comment on ordinance number 2090? I mean, not public, I mean, any commissioner questions or comments? Jarrell, this is Melissa. Can Go I ahead. The floor? Yes. Thanks. I didn't quite understand what Michael was saying about that section. I was trying to follow with my notes from the last meeting and I could use a recap of that, please, of how that would be changed, that um, page number that Faith pulled up. Like I'm unclear on, I'm, un, I'm just unclear. Because it wasn't corrected in, the, in our document? Well, for a couple reasons. I'll let him explain first and then I'll tell you. Perfect. Yeah. Mike, thanks. can you help clarify that? I can sure try. Um, so this, the discussion from last um, meeting, the, the recommendation out of the zoning commission was to have a restriction of no larger than 600 square feet um, on a lot that is less than 7,000 square feet. Um, that was the only portion of their recommendation that I did not uh, agree with and did not recommend to you. Uh, my recommendation was just to leave a flat 800 square foot um, limit on the size of the, uh, the accessory dwelling unit and then um, the lot coverage would be determined by having to meet the setbacks of that particular um, that particular lot, whatever it is. So for the side setbacks, the rear setbacks, uh, of those issues. Um, okay, can I just try, before you say anything else, can I try to say that in like my own language and you tell me if I'm understanding or not? Can we try that do. game? Okay. So the zoning commission said, if the property is smaller, it must have a smaller ADU. And if the property is bigger, it can have a larger ADU. And that's what came through to us. And then in your city manager comments, the last time we talked about it, you said, actually, you would you don't agree with that you think that it should just be 800 square feet no matter what because the size of the property itself and the setback requirements and building requirements like how far things have to be from the edge of the property line for example will automatically help control the size of the adu on smaller properties is that, that is, correct that is okay. correct Additionally, the parking requirements will also help control the size of the unit. Um, and then finally, my last concern was equal application of the law in this case. Um, one person that had a 7,000 square foot lot could build two 800 square foot ADUs on that 7,000 square foot lot if there was two primary dwellings. But a person that had two side by side 3,500 square foot lots, even though it's the exact same area of lot could only build two 600 square foot ADUs, even if they owned all of it. So I had some concerns about how that could be applied evenly when there would be two standards for two people that own the same, same amount of city property, but it happened to be subdivided differently. So last week, I remember Darrell, um, or I don't know if it was a week ago, or or a month ago, it might have been a month ago that we did this last. Um, this section was going to get sent back to the zoning commission specifically. Specifically, you said you wanted that to go back to the zoning commission. So I'm wondering, did they get it? And what did they say? 
Do we have a report back on that? Michael, can you please report back on that? I can. So it was put on the last zoning commission agenda um, to to allow them to comment on my proposed change, but they did not get to it in their meeting. Um, they adjourned the meeting before they got to that item, so they did not discuss it in their meeting. Melissa, you still have the floor. I, you know, I, I would, this is not a particularly intuitive part of this ordinance. It's like really in the weeds. So I would like to hear more from the zoning commission um, on that particular topic. Um, and did we get any more information on limitations for accessory dwelling units. Like um, one thing that's been brought up has been this res, I can't remember if the zoning commission, that last packet was really large with many layers of revisions. Can somebody remind me what um, conversations were had? I think some were had at the zoning commission about res, I don't know if it was Airbnb restrictions or resid residency requirements or um, one thing I would be interested in hearing about, because I think this has worked in communities that are tourist destinations, is, is not residency requirements, or, but rather um, requiring longer, longer leases, so they're not used as short-term rental, but rather like workforce housing. So like if you're a property owner in town and you own another property in town, you don't have to live in both properties to have a rental, but rather you have to make sure that you're doing long-term rentals, not short-term rentals for these second properties. So I'm wondering like which of those has the zoning commission explored because I don't think that they've looked at all of them, but I think they might've looked at a subset. And Darrell, I don't know who that, if that should go to Michael or if Jim's here to the zoning, <laughs> if we could hear from both of them, I'm not sure who you think that's most appropriate to go to. Or Matthew, um, Thank there's you. a couple. Yeah. There's a couple issues I hear that you're asking or asking about. First of all, can we go back to process? Just I think for clarity on the process, Michael, if you could help with this. So we had asked, or I had asked, um, about the square footage issue, and then the city bringing it back to the zoning, but there's some process because we're already in process of um, decision-making and discuss or discussion on a um, ordinance. Can you make sure that we understand pro or the process that we have to follow? Sure, I'll cover that. And I think I can cover a couple of the questions Commissioner Newt's had, and then if there's still hanging questions, we can go to someone else. Um, because this issue has already come up before the Zoning Commission in a public hearing, um, they have completed their requirements on the public hearing and closed it. So if we wanted to send it back to them for a, a complete review, we'd actually have to start the entire process completely over. Um, so it would be the Commission sending it back to the Zoning Commission. You'd basically disapprove this and then we'd start the entire process over with a new public hearing um, and that entire process, which is why what we did was just put um, the one change we were talking about on their agenda for comment. Um, unfortunately, they didn't get to it to, to provide us that comment, but that was the intent was to just get their comments on that change. Um, so that's why it can't go back to them for a full review of the entire document. Now, I know they did review um, the owner occupancy requirement. They did consider that and decided not to put it in. Um, and I know they also looked at restricting vacation rentals and decided not to put that in. Um, I don't think they, I don't, I'm not sure if they looked specifically at longer length leases, if that was part of the vacation rental discussion or not. Uh, so you'd have to ask Matthew probably on that one. Um, can you add anything on that, Matthew? Sure. Um, I don't think we discussed lease length specifically. Um, they decided not to discuss it uh, somewhat, I think, based on recommendation from staff. Uh, if we're going to start talking about lease length and differentiating between right, sort of long-term rentals and short-term rentals, that's really a use issue that should probably be applied across the board within the zoning rather than specifically to um, short-term rentals. So that's what 
I suggested to them, uh, we did have significant, significant discussion about vacation rentals uh, and how short-term rentals could impact, be impacted by ADU, certainly. Can you, I'm sorry, Daryl, can I ask yep, a please. question? Okay. Matthew, can you, um, can you explain in a little bit more detail, please, what you mean about um, applying lease length to across the board and not just ADU? Sure. So generally how uh, zoning would handle something like lease length would be a, a definition differentiation between short-term rentals and long-term rentals with something like short-term rentals being de defined as a, as a rental for a certain period of time, often under 30 days. Uh, and then that's a specific type of use within the zoning. So it'd be a defined use. And then that would go into the use table and be allowed or disallowed in specific zones. Um, that could also be applied to ADUs, but then you basically you potentially end up with a situation where you have ADUs that aren't allowed to be short-term rented, but, but full houses or houses without ADUs are allowed to be short-term rented. Um, so often it's handled separately as a different use to just a standard uh, rental. May I ask him another question? Can you, um, do you know if this is being done in Montana right now? And if so, I'm like, what I'm curious is like which communities it's being done in. Um, because I know there's different applications with depending on local government type. And this is uh, not a test. If you don't know, that's okay. <laughs> it is certainly being done in specific communities in Montana. Uh, I know Bozeman has some regulations on short-term rentals. I don't think they're very restrictive towards them. Um, I believe Whitefish has some more significant uh, regulations around short-term rentals. I could not tell you what those are, but I think they're much more restrictive. Uh, and potentially Missoula, but I'm not certain on that one. Um, but there are certainly communities that regulate short-term rentals as a specific use. Thank you so much. I, that's really helpful. I appreciate your knowledge in this topic. I know you've been working specifically on these topics for a while, it sounds like. So thank you for offering that information. Um, okay, Darrell, so you were going through my list and talking about process. And so that was the first thing you responded to was, um, the process. Do you want the floor back so you can finish responding to my list? <laughs> um, no, you go, you go ahead and do what you need to do as far as questions and clarifications and then you can open it to everyone else and I can add in. I think that was my main thoughts right now is like getting that specific feedback that we're looking for. And so that's good to hear that if we want that feedback it's as simple as voting this down, sending it back for another go around. Um, the same with the topics that have not yet been discussed that we might want to include if we're going to pass an ADU ordinance. So I appreciate knowing that the process would just be to, we just have to start over, which is fine because it's not really starting over. I mean, we have this mostly completed thing in front of us. So um, thanks for getting clarification on that. I'd be, yeah, curious to hear from other commissioners. Thank you. All right, thank you, Melissa. Um, other commissioners, any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Sounds like another table. <laughs> Until we get a clear. Uh, Commissioner Schwartz here, can I have the floor? Um, Quentin, so, Mel has the floor right now. Can you wait one oh, second? Okay. I didn't um, come in. No, it sounds like we just need more information. So there's it's in the same category as the other one. I recommend that we do table it until further actions required. All right, thank you, Mel. And Michael, I just want us to make sure that it, is that the process or is it something else where we vote it we reject it, vote it down and bring it back to, um, or put it back onto the zoning commission for consideration and, and a public hearing, et cetera, and process. And then it comes back to us. It's, can you clarify that from what Mel said? I, I think so. And I think you have a couple options. I don't think you're limited to just one. Um, you can uh, vote this down. And then if you direct them to start, they can start from scratch. Um, your other option is to pass as is and then direct them to look at items to change in the, in the ordinance. Uh, obviously the ordinance doesn't take effect for 30 days. 
no one can build an ADU in that short of amount of time. So if you wanted to pass the majority of this and then instruct the zoning commission to go back or staff to go back and look at specific items to be changed within it, you could also do that. So those are either way. Um, while you could table it for a meeting, that doesn't actually change the situation any because you it can't go back to the zoning commission while it's tabled. Um, so you can table it, that's an option, but I don't think it gets you what you want in that it doesn't go back to the zoning commission for further review. So if if you want those items re-looked at, you either reject and start all over or accept and then direct to look at specific items that you want changed or possibly want changed. So either way, those I think would get you what you're after. It just depends on how you'd like to do it. Um, this is Jim Berg. Did I say something now? Would that be appropriate? Well, um, Jim Quinton was up next. And then, okay. um, yeah, I would like to hear from the zoning commission as well. So Quinton, go ahead. Um, I'd be happy to hear from um, Jim real quick before I add my comments. Thank you. I'll yield. All right, thank you. Hi, this is Jim Berg. I'm chair of the Zoning Commission. Um, I guess I, I'm a little bit curious about what you would want the Zoning Commission to do or reconsider. We had a pretty long uh, discussion about these issues, about the sizes of the units, whether we should have a two-tiered sizing, depending on lot size, on whether we should have short-term rentals or not, whether it should be owner-occupied or not. Um, and then we voted on those motions. And um, I tended to be more conservative about that than some of the other members, but those, um, those issues were resolved in a vote and then sent to you. So sending the sending this document back to us um, for another vote. I'm not sure what, what that would accomplish. My own thinking on it is that these three issues are policy issues. And so it would be appropriate for the city commission to um, make, make a determination on that. Um, you know, other towns in the state, including Bozeman have been much more conservative about their approach to ADUs than this document did. So um, there's a wide range of thinking on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, other commissioner questions? <laughs> yeah, this, um, Commissioner Schwartz. Yep, go ahead, Quentin. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, Jim basically re reiterated everything that I was thinking as well. Um, I think these are all separate issues that should be taken up separately, um, specifically um, um, short -ter term rentals. Um, I think that needs to be across the board, not just limited to ADUs. Um, yeah, um, I know Adam Stern has provided me with a lot of information regarding that, you know, which could go back to planning or zoning. Um, with that regard, um, there's you know various models out there to look at, um, but I do believe it's a separate issue away from the ADU. Um, and I, yeah, I, I agree with Jim um, on these things. I don't know what would be gained by sending it back in this form to zoning. Um, I think they're the issues that were brought up are separate and can be dealt with uh, separately. Thank you. I yield. Thank you, Quentin. Um, I guess I have a question if you, if everyone doesn't mind just asking again about process. So after say this was accepted as is, okay, um, but then we would like to visit some changes to the ordinance. Can you, Michael, just go through that process? Say that um, we do decide that we want them 1,500 square feet. I'm kidding because that would be too big. Um, but if we wanted consideration of 1,500 square feet, bring it to the zoning commission and the city, visit that issue. What is the process to say change something within the ordinance at a future date? 
So once it's passed, it's just a part of our code. So it's the same process we would use to change any part of the ordinances. Um, you could assign that to staff initially. We would draw up some ideas and then pass it to the appropriate board, depending on what the issue is, whether that was planning or zoning. Um, uh, schedule it on them. If they then wanted to hold a public hearing on it, they'd hold a public hearing on the change to the ordinance, whatever the draft was, they would make their recommendation, send it up to you as the commission, you would review it just like you're reviewing this. And then it, it went through a public hearing at the, um, the commission level, if it's especially with the zoning issue, it would go through a public hearing process. You'd see it at two meetings. And then if you passed it in both, it would take effect 30 days later. So the process is ostensibly the same for any change to the process we're going through now. Um, it's, there's nothing special because that we passed it this week, you could next week look at a public hearing to change it. Um, it. We couldn't get through the zoning commission that fast, but there's no, it's not like you can't change it for a year. Or there's a time limit on it. You can absolutely go back and change any aspect of it anytime you want, because that's your authority as the city commission. All right. Thank you. Um, that helps. Um, any, I, I have a few thoughts, so I, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything before I speak. I, can I ask you a clarifying question? Because I'm looking at this chart and we've had several versions come before us now. Um, I'm look, specifically, I'm looking at the charts on like page 72, 73 of our agenda. And I'm thinking about like, how many ADUs are we talking about per property? Um, and this gets back into, you know, partly what Michael was talking about earlier. Can you walk us through that just a little bit, Michael, please? I, I can if I can find my unmute button. Um, so the number of accessory dwelling units is actually controlled by the number of primary units. Um, so for every, to build an accessory dwelling unit, there has to be a primary dwelling unit that that would be attached to. So it doesn't matter how big a parcel is, if it only has one um, primary unit, it can only have one accessory unit. So where that becomes a little trickier is if you have one parcel with a duplex, um, now you can have two accessory dwelling units within that if you can meet the requirements for the setbacks. So the number of accessory dwelling units is linked directly to the number of primary units. Um, so you couldn't build an accessory dwelling unit on, a, on an empty lot. You would have to build a house first. Um, but once a house is built, then you could build an accessory dwelling unit to go with it. And can I just ask a question on that, Melissa? Like, because that was one of my questions. So what's the house's size requirement in comparison to an ADU? So if tiny house could be 400 feet, uh, square feet, and then an ADU could be 800, or can you clarify that? I can, I just have to find the actual, um, uh, uh, Matthew, do you know where that requirement is? I'm, I'm pretty sure that it has to be smaller than the primary unit. Yeah, so if you look at the definition of accessory dwelling unit, uh, it defines it in a way that the accessory would have to be smaller than the primary. Um, that does mean you could have a tiny home and a larger ADU potentially on the property, but the, the larger ADU would be the primary. Uh, and based on the way it's written, the tiny home would have to be in the, basically to the rear of the primary dwelling. Okay, thank you. Melissa, continue. I just, because you were in that area, I wanted that clarification. Well, I think what would be helpful, you know, is this, I feel like when we talk about ADUs, we're talking, generally what we're talking about is like a smaller house or like, like, you know, behind a larger house, like maybe what you see in the older first plats of Livingston, like the first neighborhoods of Livingston. Um, or like an apartment above a garage. But there are these ideas that creep in, like does this mean that a duplex or like a fourplex could now have four independent buildings behind the fourplex? And it, like, 
I'm just trying to get my head around what the property would be like to allow that kind of space because I don't have the code memorized, like the building code memorized. Right. So, so I'm making sure that I'm just thinking like, is this really, are we getting what we want out of this with multiple ADUs on a property? So if you'd like, I can address how that would work. Is that okay? Michael. So if you look at on the top of page 69 and scroll down just a little bit, if you would, um, you can see that it has the, uh, our zoning areas, right? R1, R2, R2MH and R3. So those are the first four categories. And then if you go to page 70, you can see that accessory dwelling units are only allowed in R1, R2 and R2MH. So you can't get more than two units in those zoning areas. So two would be the maximum use that should be allowable. A fourplex, I believe, has to be zoned R3. Am I correct in that, Matthew? Yeah, okay. So since ADUs are not allowed in R3, you, can't, you couldn't put four ADUs with a fourplex. Um, one thing that we don't mention a lot in this is technically right now, if you have a house and you're renting out your basement, you are violating zoning code because you have two dwellings in one, on one lot. Uh, this actually solves that problem. You could rent out your basement. Um, that's when we talk about an interior or a connected um, accessory dwelling unit. That's one thing that this, this code does clear up. But in general, because of the zoning, you can only get one or two ADUs per lot. And okay. only two if it's zoned R2 and you have a duplex or two primary dwellings. So in my neighborhood, which is an R2, there are four plexes. Probably they were built before our zoning was what it is today. And in my neighborhood, there are, you know, houses that are divided, just like you described with like split houses, however they're split to be rentals with ADUs on the same property. So I'm trying to imagine a world where this ordinance passes and what does it mean for those properties that are already existing that don't match our current definitions of R2. And I suspect around Livingston that there are a lot of them. So I'm wondering like, how does that fit in? So in that case, if, if they're not already existing accessory dwelling units, they're gonna to have to apply for building permits. Uh, and we would not approve building permits for four auxiliary dwelling units on, in an R2 zoning. Um, and I don't know if we need to, if we reflect that in the code or not, Matthew, maybe you can chime in on that. Uh, but we still have the building permit process. Uh, and with the requirements for parking, uh, I'm not sure you could fit four parking spaces and four ADUs on a, depending on how big the lot is, I guess. Uh, but those are some of the requirements that would, would limit what people could do with it. Uh, if they already have an accessory dwelling unit, this would actually make them compliant with the code instead of non-compliant with the code. So I think that's probably a plus for them um, because right now there's nowhere the accessory dwelling units are allowed. So I guess it's a benefit if you already have one, uh, you would come into compliance, but I think we could handle the special situations where people are uh, non-conforming to the current zoning. Um, do you have anything to say on that, Matthew? Am I, am I in the ballpark? Yeah, that's essentially correct. Um, basically, um, if you have the full zoning in section 30.62, which is a non-conforming use, if you have a fourplex in an R2 district, uh, that would be considered a non-conforming use. And there's some pretty strict uh, restrictions on what you can do with them. And you essentially can't enlarge them or expand them without a variance. Uh, so generally, either the ADUs would, or the additional two units would become ADUs and it becomes sort of a strange situation. Um, and they essentially remain legal non-conforming uses. If the square footage of those is too large, uh, they wouldn't be really allowed any ADUs without coming in for a variant. Um, you basically can't expand that use and adding additional dwelling units onto an already uh, non-conforming parcel would need a variance to do so. All right, Melissa. That's really in the weeds. And so thank you for um, taking some time to walk through those um those hypotheticals and also thank you to Jim Berg for uh expanding and giving us that feedback all right 
Thank you. Um, any other commissioners? Questions? Madam Chair? Yep, Quentin, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't want us to lose sight of um, what we're trying to do with this. Um, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of um, uh, development illegally done, and what we're trying to do is make this in a way where we can regulate it and, and do it legally, um, legally and conforming. Um, you know, certainly there's places that are grandfathered in already that are legal but non-conforming. Um, we want to we want to stop that. We want we want to be able to have um, um, some direction and some say in how, and how we're developing this. So I just don't want to lose sight of that fact. Um, and I've gone through this in great, pretty great detail, and I don't find any thing that can't be amended or taken care of later, especially with, um, with pertaining to um, vacation rentals, which um, I stated before is um, a whole separate, a whole separate um, issue to begin with um, to regulate and number of them and how many. And uh, with that, um, yeah, just don't want to lose sight of the fact of what we're trying to do with the ADU. Thank you, I yield, madam. All right, thank you. Um, I guess I will uh, just express a couple of, I guess, my concerns. So I'm trying to kind of play out scenarios. Um, and so say you had a, a duplex or a, a, a home that's split into two, and then you add an ADU to the property. So there's potentially three, and I do I do have major concerns, or potentially three rentals. And I have major concerns with the, the three being um, vacation rentals and how that does impact, um, you know, the neighborhood and the transient kind of population just coming in and out, you know, and in a neighborhood is that's hard sometimes on, on communities or on the um, area, having, you know, every other day groups coming in and out. And that is a concern. I do like the idea of having a required residence um, but I also see that expanded in such a way that I, I don't think it's possible to do a required residence necessarily for, because some people own more than one property and we know that, but it could also include that one of those is a longer term, you know, that, that a rental with it, with an ADU or with a vacation rental or ADU used as a vacation rental, for example, um, is that possible to put that, I guess that might be a Matthew or Michael question. Um, is that possible and is that common or how, what does that look like as far as um, regulating that within the ordinance or um, requiring that within the ordinance? So I think that that's, those are all valid, valid concerns that we probably should address, but I think that is probably easier to address and probably more efficient to address in a separate ordinance on vacation rentals, um, because then you it's not necessarily tied just to accessory dwelling units. It would apply to other, it would apply to duplexes as well. Um, and we could look at at ordinances, and this is just an example, I have no idea if this would work or not, uh, where you could say you can't have more than one short-term rental per, um, per parcel. So even if you had a duplex, you could only rent one of them as a short-term rental and the other would have to be a long-term rental. Uh, and then if they actually put two accessory dwelling units on there, if that was one parcel and that was our, our ordinance, they could only still rent one out as a short-term rental and the other three would have to be long-term rentals. And we could play with that. We could say at, at least 50% have to be long-term rentals or owner-occupied. Um, and then th there's a lot of flexibility there, but I think that those are great issues to be addressed. But I think as Matthew said earlier, those are, those are issues that we want to address across all our dwelling units, whether they're single family homes, duplexes, fourplexes, whatever. Um, I think we want that all, all covered in one, uh, one ordinance, one area and not attached to the, just the acceler accessory dwelling units. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. That alleviates that concern quite a bit. Um, 
My other concern has to do with the square footage. I do worry about um, kind of cramming in, and I know we have requirements of setbacks, et cetera, but cramming in a property that's potential or a ADU that's potentially big, as big as a house, and then just like having two houses, and then you, you know, so the, the square footage that the zoning commission had um, approved or had discussed and had within the public um, hearing or the public meeting was the six was 600 feet and then the city is recommending 800. I still am uncomfortable with the change in the square footage. So I guess my own last major question is just, I know you've mentioned it already once and you tried to explain it, but I do feel like I, I think we need, or I need some more clarification on that, the validity of moving up 200 square feet. Um, because my major concern is that these become like the monsters in the backyard, you know, that are sort of changing um, the visual design and the, the essence of our, our community and the design of our, um, you know, especially our older areas of town that in their character. I just worry about the character changing because of having like a monster sized house in the backyard. Can you help me with the number, the square footage and the validity? I think so. Um, so the, the zoning commission actually recommended two different sizes of auxiliary dwelling units, depending on the size of lot. Um, so they had a 600 foot one, but they also had an 800 square foot one. So they also allowed 800 square feet if you had at least a 7,000 square foot lot. Um, I think, and this is, it gets super complicated, super fast, and, and it's kind of hard to follow, but especially if you're doing a two-story accessory dwelling unit, let's say you're putting in um, a garage as your parking requirement, and then you're doing an apartment above the garage, and maybe a little in front of the garage, you can get to 800 square feet in that, in that dwelling without taking up a huge amount of the backyard. Um, and I think you can see that now just with how the current neighborhoods have developed. There is no size restriction on outbuildings um, in these neighborhoods right now. So you could build your garage with a gigantic shop to take up your entire lot. Um, there's no restriction on that whatsoever. But I think, I think people do appreciate the character of the community and they do appreciate the character of, of their lots in town. And I think they would maintain that with the restrictions already in place by the setbacks. Um, 800 square feet still isn't going to be a gigantic um, building in the back of most of those lots. Um, you know, the, the, in the smallest lots, if it's a 3,500 square foot lot, it would be super hard to get 800 square feet in. And I don't think it'd be visually appealing to anybody. So I'm not sure anyone would do that. Um, but if they can come up with a creative way to do that, I don't think we should restrict them based off an arbitrary 600 versus 800. 200 square feet, I mean, if you think about it, it's a 10 by 20 room um, is the difference between the two, uh, which is not very large. So I think the setbacks will keep them smaller on the smaller lots. Uh, and I think the ability to creatively come up with 800 square feet in a good design, I'd, I'd hate to limit that um, based off of assuming that they're just gonna build a ranch style ADU. Cause I would assume a lot of people won't or they'll convert a garage that already exists um, on the property to kind of use that square footage wisely. So I, I think it is a concern that we want to maintain the character. And I think that's why the Zoning Commission and Matthew did a great job of the restrictions they do have in there of it. It can't be bigger than the primary, can, would only be 800 square feet and has to be to the rear. Plus the parking requirements, I think really controls the size of the accessory dwelling units pretty well without us having to have the two tiers uh, and then worry about the the unequal application of the law based on that. So I think that 200 square feet probably will not be noticeable in most lots. Okay, that's that's helpful. Although arbitrary could be 600 or 800, just saying. Um, my, my other just point I wanna make before I think I'm done is one of the things I have wanted for a long time is ADUs or some type of um, 
planning that included ADUs or, or infill, so our community is utilizing the properties within our um, community and within the center of our community to have rentals, to offer the, um, you know, a family member, a, you know, the mother-in-law suite kind of concept so that families can utilize their own spaces for families, for rentals, for in extra inter income, but it also helps us to prevent sprawl and to fill in and keep people close to our downtown, close to our services, which I like. And I'm a huge fan of ADUs for that reason. Um, I mean, I wish we had more, you know, building up, which is a whole other growth policy issue, but more building up and less building out. Um, and ADUs are that a mini step towards that. Um, that's all I have to say. So going on to uh, last comments from the commissioners. Anything else? I think for me, Durrell, like my biggest concern is the community still, I mean, I'm gonna go back and say the community wanted us to do the large retail format and that's still, they wanted us to do that first. We voted on it. That's still not in front of us. This is, um, if we have ADUs, now there's gonna be pressure to address vacation rentals or short-term rentals because these will get built. Maybe not this winter, but definitely next year. And everything is bumping off the list. It seems like, you know, new pressures come and things just keep bumping off the list. And I'm, I'm wishing that ADUs was coming in conjunction with the rental topic, because I think this doesn't ensure that we're gonna be getting long-term rentals for the people that work here. Um, and still that large format, you know, the big box store topic is still just hanging out, waiting to get wrapped up also. So I wonder what kind of pressure that puts on the commission to move those other topics forward. Um, well, thank you, Melissa. Um, I, mean, I think those are valid concerns. I think we just have to be very direct and concrete about what we want moved forward when. And we know we we have these things list and maybe Michael at the end, you can give us an update on the large format, retail format, um, because I know that's a big issue. So, and, um, so we do have to move forward on this issue tonight and talk about, you know, we're at the second reading, we have to make a decision or have a motion um, on how we get this to move forward. We, are we ready for some type of movement in, in this, uh, or on this ordinance? Can I, can I say to Sorry. No, I'll, I'll yield again. I was going to say, Chair Hoagland, that I think we have been direct. I mean, we voted. So, I mean, I, I agree that we need to be direct, but we also have been direct. And so, I just want to point out that we have been direct and we have voted on it, and things are coming up in different orders, even after being direct. So, well, let's you. go. And thank you, Melissa. Um, I think, like I said, I, I think. That concern that we do need to address, um, but we do have on our agenda a decision to make, and we need to move this decision in one direction or another. Um, I would like at the end, so I, close, I think there are um, comments made on some, you know, the plans for those next, uh, those issues that Melissa brought up, because that has been brought from this we'll move that to the end during, um, during comments from the city manager. Um, 
So can we move on back or move back to the ordinance? So we have ordinance number 2090 and Quentin, you were going to say something? Yeah, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, regardless of where we want to be, uh, this is where we are tonight um, dealing with this. And uh, um, large format retail is um, near and dear to my heart and uh, Adam Stern's done a lot of work on it. Um, I'm not sure if zoning department has that stuff, all the work that he did do on it, but I will pass that along. But um, this is where we're at right now with the accessory dwelling units. Um, I'd like to move forward um, on either moving this forward or uh, you know taking it to a vote at this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Quentin. Any last things before we have a motion? And motion can have additions like Michael was giving, you know, you can move it to the city for um, discussion or to, for work on a certain issue that can be done as well, that can be clarified. I'd like to move forward on 2090 as a separate item. I think it'd be a lot cleaner to uh, to address any of the other issues separately, and it also will not uh, burden uh, those involved with uh, having to revisit this, um, and uh, they can de devote time to uh, the other sub uh, separate topics. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Warren. Are you making a statement or a motion? We're waiting, waiting for you to call for the motion. Um, well, his had a little bit of a motion sound to it, so I didn't, didn't want to. Uh... <laughs> I okay. make a motion to approve 2090. <laughs> okay, do we have a motion on ordinance number 2090? I will make a motion to approve ordinance 2090. Second. We have a motion by Schwartz and a second by maybe. Roll call, please. Chair Hoagland. Yes. Commissioner Schwartz. Four. Commissioner Freeman. Four. Commissioner Maybe. Four. Commissioner Newts. Four. Motion passes. It is an hour and a half in. Um, we should take our five minute break. Um, so please put on the timer and give us Five minutes. Okay. Melissa, do you have anything else? Nope. So Are there any other questions or comments from the commission? All right, I guess um, I don't have any. But do we have a motion from the commission? Are we ready for a motion? I feel like that went really fast, so I'm weirded out. Do I have a motion from the commission on ordinance number 2091? I'll make a motion to approve ordinance 2091. We have a motion by Schwartz and a second by maybe, I guess. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, roll call, please. Chair Hoagland. Yes. Commissioner Schwartz. Four. Commissioner Freeman. Four. Commissioner Maybe. Four. Commissioner Newt. Four. Motion passes. Tonight, we are, sorry, um, that was a, okay, I have to get some clarification. That was a public comp or public hearing and I didn't open it. So we do. there were public comments, there were, but that public hearing should have been opened and I apologize and closed. Um, but I, are we all okay with that? 
So we're moving on to ordinances. Uh, we have ordin ordinance number 2092, an ordinance of the city commission of the city of Livingston, Montana, amending article seven, chapter 30 of the Livingston municipal code entitled zoning as it pertains to zoning commission text amendments. Mr. Cardus. Thank you, Madam Chair. From the last zoning commission meeting, there was two um, I'll say two sets of recommendations that came out. One was administrative changes that we had brought before them uh, for their approval. Those will come before you in 2093. Um, we all agreed on those. The Zoning Commission also wanted to address the role of the chair and the agenda. So on page 113, um, you'll see the, um, the single change that we're discussing in this ordinance, uh, which, which provides the chair of the Zoning Commission to set the meeting agendas in consultation with the commission, city manager, and staff. Um, the, the staff and myself as a city manager recommend um, not approving this ordinance, uh, mainly because in this case, these issues should be um, brought to you through a, a bylaws amendment, uh, because the bylaws are really what drives how a board or a commission operates. So this is more appropriately in a uh, bylaws amendment, but since they brought it up in the meeting and voted on it, we wanted to bring it before you. But I would recommend not approving this as an ordinance change and then letting it, letting them bring it to you again as a change to the bylaws for your approval. All right, thank you. So we'll open it to public comment on ordinance number 2092. Any public comment? Uh, any public comments? Uh, this is Jim Burt. Um, this was a motion that I made before the Zoning Commission and we discussed it and approved it. Um, and the, the reason we did that was because of the way in which the ADU ordinance was inserted into our regular schedule because we had an agreement with the City Commission to work on a large format retail. Um, so it just, it just makes sense from our position or perspective that there has to be um, clarity in terms of how the agenda is set and, and it has to kind of proceed in an orderly manner. In, in the case of the ADU uh, ordinance, that was um, city staff issued a, a, a public notice that we were having a meeting to discuss ADUs, so that took it entirely out of our hands. And so we went, we went along with it and uh, held those hearings. Uh, so whether this goes in the bylaws or is left in here, I think um, is, is not a, an issue for us. Great, thank you, Jim. Any other public comment? Okay, let's move it to commissioner comments or questions. Any commissioner comments? Melissa? Yeah, Darrell, I'm just thinking like that's like thinking about what it's like to be on a board and um, I'm wondering if we can get more clarification on that topic. I think if the secretary and the chairs of these boards are putting together agendas, sometimes months in advance, like with the planning board, for example, um, it would be a challenge to find out that there was a public notice or, you know, for a public hearing when that time may have already been scheduled to do something else. So how can we make sure that we don't repeat this as a city where boards are being surprised? Because um, that seems to be the crux of the issue for this ordinance. So maybe some more information on how that happened and how we can make sure that doesn't happen again. 
recommendations from the city staff on on fixing that challenge? I don't know who you would direct it to, Darrell, but that's kind of what's on my mind because it seems like that's the reason we have this in front of us right now. Right, and I think uh, how we could ask that and still, still stay on the subject of the ordinance is, can you clarify why, again, why you think that it goes into bylaws and then uh, versus in the actual ordinance itself? Um, and why would it be, a, did it, would it help this process issue, which is, or the time, the planning issue of when things were addressed by the planning or by the zoning commission, which now has come up three times tonight. And I know it's come up at other meetings. And so why is it to the advantage of having it in the bylaws? But if, is that enough to make it follow through on, I guess? Michael and or Courtney, this might be a le legal, um, question as well. I'll take a swing at it. And if Courtney wants to add anything, I will allow her. Uh, I'm kidding. I just like to say that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in general, the bylaws control how all the all the boards are run. So anything that's in the bylaws is binding. It's approved by you as a commission. It holds the same force as any other decision by the commission. Um, it holds true for the Parks and Trails Board, for the Planning Board, for the Zoning Commission. Uh, all of those bylaws come before you and are approved by you. So it is a city commission uh, directive once they are approved. So there is no doubt that it will hold the force of the will of the commission. So that's not an issue. Uh, but in general, the only um, board or council or commission um, rules that are in ordinance are the city commissions themselves. And even those we limited um, because it's, it's very difficult to change them if the board wants to change um, how they operate. Uh, so instead of, if we put something in an ordinance, if the board wants to change it, they have to uh, bring that up as an ordinance, then we have to have a second reading of the ordinance and then it doesn't take place for another 30 days. So it's 60 to 90 days before a board or a commission can change how they operate. However, if we put it in the bylaws, that's just a simple resolution that can come before the commission. Uh, it's much easier, it's much more flexible for them. Um, if they wanna change when they meet, let's say they wanna change the date and time of the, the standard meeting. And I think the um, I think this just happened with the conservation board. They brought their bylaws in front of you to change. And one of the things was the day and time they met. Um, it's a much easier process and much easier for them to um, set up their commission and boards the way they want them to be run if those requirements are in the bylaws and not in ordinances. So that's why I would recommend those being in the bylaws. Um, I don't know, Courtney, do you have anything to add to that? Good evening. I think Mike is largely correct. Also, the ordinances are supposed to be That's better. What you do, bylaws are supposed to be how the boards do it. And the bylaws for the commission should be in ordinance and the bylaws for your administrative boards should be their own bylaws that come before you by resolution. Thank you. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, any other questions, comments? I don't feel like my concern has been addressed. Okay, can you clarify that and what um, you'd like answered more through? Sure. So I'm wondering how, if the suggestion is to put it in bylaws, which that part makes sense to me. Thank you, Michael and Courtney. Um, how do we, or maybe, you know, this requires putting it on a future agenda, but how do we word it such that the boards have some lead time on 
these public notices rather than being surprised when they go to their next meeting. Because I know like zoning and uh, variances, which now comes before the commission are a little bit different than some of the other, they're like some specific things that are particular to certain boards like the board of adjustments or the zoning commission that might be a little bit different than um, why is the planning board has public hearings, but um, how can we do it so that they're not surprised if it's in the bylaws? Is that possible to write it some way in the bylaws? Because we're talking specifically about scheduling the agendas with this ordinance. So this addition to the bylaws, if it went to the bylaws versus into the um ordinance itself does that cover enough of that concern step, the steps that need to be taken to uh really out of uh respect for the time and the work that the committee uh does for our community and our commission so is that enough i guess that's a Kind of a legal is it enough to cover that concern or do we need to add an addition to it as to what melissa's saying um and i know i feel like we're on two different things here in a way but on the other hand i think they're so applicable that i'm worried about not making a, a, a good decision for myself on this ordinance without that influence so michael do you get what i'm asking I do. I think, honestly, I don't think this is a persistent problem and maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't heard any complaints other than this one instance. Uh, and across the five or seven boards that we have for the past few years, I don't think one instance is a, is a trend. Um, we can, you know, we can look at, at how that happened and make sure it doesn't, but I don't think it happens in general. There are some things that we don't have, um, we don't have any choice about whether those are applications for zoning changes or some other items that by law we have to um, respond to within a certain amount of time. There's no way we can um, not do that. But I, I don't think this is a widespread problem nor even a repeated problem with the zoning commission. Uh, maybe Jim can speak to that, but I think it was only one time. And I think that was just, uh, just a cross communication because I'm pretty sure Jim had already been contacted about that meeting. I just don't think he'd gotten back to us by the time it was, um, by the time it was published. So I don't think it was that they weren't contacted. I just think the timing didn't line up. It was probably just a, a miscommunication somewhere. So I don't think it's a, a, cons, a consistent problem, certainly not across boards. And I don't think even within the zoning commission. So, I mean, we can look at trying to solve it through a bylaws change, but I think it probably would be easier just to make sure that we're, we're communicating the way we need to. Okay. Um, well, I'm I think we could maybe apologize to the zoning commission for sort of throwing it on the timing. Um, well, well um, Madam Chair, this is Jim Bird. Um, <clears throat> I would, I think I would like to take this back matter back to the zoning commission next week and have it inserted into the bylaws. And then it's just a clear a clarification. Um, and I think I, also that I, I think I, carefully wrote it in the sense that I'm not trying to totally control the agenda myself, but, um, uh, you know, obviously when things come up that are serious or there's a time, a legal a time deadline, um, we need to be flexible about it, but um, I, I think there just needs to be one person setting the agenda. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, all right. Any other comments, questions on this item? So we're at ordinance number 2092. So do I have a motion from the commission on ordinance number 2092? Yeah, I make a motion we pass ordinance. Yeah. 2092. Um, we have a it kind of cut out, Quint, you say second? Um, and I'll second that. Okay, all right. Um, 
so we have a motion um, by Friedman and a second by Schwartz. Roll call, please. Chair Feldman? No. Commissioner Schwartz? No. Commissioner Friedman? No. Commissioner Maybe? No. Commissioner Newts? No. Motion. Uh, next on our agenda, we have ordinance number 2093, an ordinance of the City Commission of the Cities of Livingston, Montana, amending article 17, or 17, sorry, 7, chapter 30 of the Livingston Municipal Code entitled Zoning as it pertains to text amendments. Mr. Cardius. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So this ordinance is just, again, cleaning up some of the administrative um, items on how map amendments are accomplished. Um, this is the first reading. It will come before you again if passed. Uh, it calls out some additional forms that we're going to apply, um, how applications should be submitted. So it is just a, a clarification of how people can uh, and how the process for amendments to the zoning map can be initiated. Michael, can you just elaborate like why we should be looking at this? What What's the importance of, of these changes? Really, this is just a, a, a change to streamline the process from as far as staff is concerned, and also to streamline the process for any individuals that want to apply. Um, if Matthew's still on, I'll let him talk to the specifics of it. Yeah, uh, quickly, uh, the impetus of this is it's um, basically there's two different zoning change processes, both of which you've seen today, one being a map amendment, which was the first ordinance you heard today, and then being the other being text amendments, uh, which were the sort of the last two. Um, and basically, the way the zoning was written, those had the exact same process, and it was very clearly written for map amendments, where it specifically stated that we need to um, basically send a certified mailer to every property within 300 feet of the specific amendments. Uh, that is very unclear with text amendments because they often don't have specific properties that those are attached to unlike map amendments um, and could be interpreted in two different ways. One that we don't need to send any mailers, which is what has been happening, or the other one uh, for something like ADUs, you would potentially have to send a certified mail to every single property in the city. Uh, which is potentially hundreds of hours of staff time and thousands of dollars in mailing fees. So that was really the impetus of this was just to clarify uh, the distinction between those two types of amendments uh, and the two ways that they are noticed uh, and making sure the submittal requirements uh, and review requirements were applicable to the specific type of application rather than being generalized between uh, two of the, those two, if, if, since they're a little bit different. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, any other um, clarification from Michael or anyone else? Uh, I would just add that this again went through the Zoning Commission. Um, it was approved uh, unanimously at the Zoning Commission and is recommended by the staff all the way through. So everyone's unanimous in these recommendations. All right, thank you. Um, any public comment on ordinance number 2093? Any public comment? Okay, any commissioners questions or comments? I'll kick it off. Go ahead. I think um, I appreciate the attention to detail to separate these two things. Um, in the notes from Matthew or Jim, whoever submitted those about um, the importance of clarifying this, these documents. And I wanted, since we spent so much time on the city manager wording last meeting, I wanted to point out that that's another addition here. And I think um, it's pretty obvious that the city manager should be able to initiate this because, you know, <laughs> leaving it all up on the commissions that are not actually staff seems like we could miss some important things. And so I just want to clarify, like, um, 
I'm assuming that that would be the process that staff would go through if they noticed that there needed to be a change or an amendment that they would take it to. Oh, sorry, my phone's making noise. Um, I just want to clarify that, like, for the staff process, if like the planning department staff noticed that there needed to be a change, what they would probably do then, Michael, is bring it to you to initiate that process. Is that correct? And then that's how it would end up on an agenda. That is correct if it was staff initiated, but it could be initiated by either the city commission or the zoning commission or even just a private citizen. So there's, there's actually four ways it could be introduced, but if it was staff initiated, yes, it would come to me and then we would get it put on probably a zoning commission agenda first. And the staff just has to fill out that form like the application form, um, which would go through the planning department. So I think that's like an obvious insertion that I'm surprised wasn't on here before, but I think, so I, I'm in favor of, I think that these are smart ways to clean up and bring these documents up to date because I'm guessing they were just very outdated. Um, the last time that they'd been updated, we probably had some big differences in Livingston. So I don't have any questions. I just wanted to make sure I said those things. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Any other comments? <coughs> All right. Um, my only comment is I agree with Melissa. I really appreciate the kind of the delving into the weeds of all the um, all our ordinances and, and working through language and the that the staff and in the case of the zoning commission helping um, our zoning board helping us with with that and catching things and working through it. We really appreciate it. That's all I have. Do we have, so I guess we're ready for a motion. Do we have a motion on ordinance number 2893? I'll make a motion this time for, oh, he beat me, I'll second. <laughs> we have a motion by Friedman and I think, it's, sometimes it's hard to hear and a second by Newt, okay. Mo or, uh, roll call, please. Sorry. Chair Hoagland. Yes. Commissioner Schwartz. Uh, four. Commissioner Friedman. Four. Commissioner Maybe. Four. Commissioner Newts. Four. Motion passes. Moving on. We have two resolutions tonight. Our first resolution is resolution number 4928, a resolution of the city commission of the city of Livingston, Montana on its intent to change the name of Northtown Road within the Northtown subdivision to Sweet Grass Lane. Mr. Carter. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We're gonna try and share a picture of what we're talking about. So. Last meeting, you saw the uh, you did the final plat approval for the Northtown subdivision. Uh, unfortunately, they had forgotten to change the name of one of the roads, um, and I believe we've already started to address under the new name. So, um, the main road into Phase Two and Phase Three of Northtown on the plat was, I believe, Northtown Road. Um, yep, there it was. So that's that's how you approved it as Northtown Road. Uh, the developer is asking to now change that to Sweetgrass Lane. Um, which was their intent. I think it was just an omission from their plat. So what's before you tonight is just a resolution to change that street name from, from Northtown Road to Sweet Grass Lane in accordance with the developer's request. Well, and thank you, but we already know that it's been util or named Sweet Grass and it just is it more of a technical, we have to change it officially. <clears throat> They had, they had meant to request that on the plat, but they'd forgotten to change the actual name on the document. So that was their intent and we knew that intent and we were actually working with that towards addressing. And now we just need to correct it on the final plat so that everything matches up. All right, perfect, thank you. Okay, any public comment? You're on mute, Drew. How much of mute was I on? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you called for public comment, and that's the last I heard. Okay. Sorry about that. It's 
because the dogs are wrestling. I keep having to turn it off. Um, okay, any public or not public, I'm sorry, any commissioner questions or comments? All right, any, anyone want to uh, propose a motion or give us a motion on ordinance number 2048, or sorry, 4928. I make a motion we pass 4928 resolution. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Friedman and a second by maybe. Roll call, please. Chair Hoagland. Yes. Mr. Schwartz. Commissioner Schwartz. Four. Commissioner Maybe. Four. Four. Commissioner Newt. Four. Motion passes. Okay. Caden, our second resolution is resolution number 4929, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Livingston. Montana authorizing the city manager to sign a buy sell agreement with David M for the purchase of his building located at 20, or 220 East Park Street in Livingston. Mr. Cardus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. But I might recommend that we go down to uh, action item B first so we can look at the totality of the money that we're looking at and then come back to the specific item. They're only on this order because it was a resolution instead of an action item. But I think the commission would probably appreciate looking at the holistically at the funds we're talking about before we talk about the specific item, if that would, if that would please you. All right, I think that's a good idea. Commissioners, everyone's okay with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, putting resolution number 20, or 4929 to the side, let's move on to action item B. So uh, discuss approved deny CARES Act revenue funding options. Mr. Cardus. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this year, while unique in many, uh, many ways, uh, the COVID funding that we have received so far um, has been in, um, they don't like to call it, uh, a refund of our, our salaries, but they basically paid us for our cost in salary for um, the police department, the fire department, fire and ambulance, uh, and dispatch. And so a lot of that salary has been um, refunded to us. And then those funds become available in the general fund. Um, uniquely, uh, and I'm gonna show you uh, Montana law, although it's not gonna make a ton of sense because it's, a, it's kind of an obscure law, uh, but basically, this Montana law basically tells you that you can, um, a city or towns, and I'll highlight it for you. So they're talking about reserves here, um, may not exceed one half of the total amount appropriated and authorized. So basically what that's saying is your general fund reserve cannot be larger than 50% of what you expended in the year. So there's a cap on how much money you can have in your general fund. Um, because we've been refunded a significant amount of salary, we're actually going to exceed that 50% 50 per, 50 mark. Um, and that money hasn't been appropriated towards anything. So what we're presenting to you tonight um, is our estimate, and I'll bring it up on the screen, our estimate of what we will have in excess of that 50% reserve, um, which is the maximum we can hold, and then some ideas on ways that we thought we could spend that money um, and I'll give you some uh, some requirements that we looked at when we were trying to determine the best ways to spend them. Uh, this is one-time money so we really tried to focus on one-time expenditures. Uh, we looked at capital things that we could buy that we were going to have to buy anyway that we could save that cost in future um, in future budgets but we also looked at items that were unlikely to get funded without this kind of one-time unexpected uh, revenue. So we looked at, at at things that we thought the community was really interested in, things that met needs in the community that wouldn't usually be funded because this is a unique opportunity to fund those items. Um, and then we tried to spread it across as many interest areas in the city um, and reference that back to the strategic plan uh, because that was the guidance that we already received from the city commission. So the spreadsheet you're looking at now is 
the estimate of what the available funds would be from the CARES Act. So that's up here. Um, I can make it bigger so maybe you can see it better. Uh, so that is what we expect to have in excess of the 50% reserve. Um, we then created the spreadsheet. Uh, it's kind of fun You can click on and off things and it adds or doesn't add. Um, and out of that 2.235 million, uh, we have suggested spending all but 19,000 of it. So honestly, we still would have to, to allocate that 19,550 um, before the end of June. So that's, that's the other limiting factor on this is to not be part of the reserve. It has to be spent by the end of the fiscal year. It has to be spent by 30 June um, of 21. So that's kind of the, the limitations that we were under is it, it won't be available for multiple years because you can't hold it over. Um, and it has to be spent by June or it will go away at that point. So that being said, we then came up with a list of things that we thought met the, the commission's intent that met the city's needs and met the community's desires. Um, and so we spread it out across a lot, of, a lot of areas. The ones in blue on the top have already come before the commission and you've already um, authorized allocating that money. So those were, were already spent. That includes air quality monitors, um, the purple air monitors that we're talking about, the parks and trails uh, funding, which they I think are working through a process right now and how they would like to spend that. And then the body cameras for law enforcement. So that um, just over $100,000 was already uh, allocated and is already, I think some of it has already been spent. So that leaves us to the rest of the items. And then these are in no particular order um, because I didn't want to present these as, as priorities because they're not, these are all the ideas of the staff. Um, and I'll kind of leave those up for, there for you to look at. They include the warming center, um, but I do want to explain a few of these things. Um, so $11,000 for the warming center. And the reason that's $11,000 is because that's something I think we could do in a repeatable manner, I think we could, um, I think we could spend that annually on a warming center. So that would inject that amount of money for this year. But then also, this year we uh, spent, uh, we tried to give those donations to um, to organizations that were participating in the Hoot campaign, so that they could double up those contributions. Uh, we didn't have the chance to do that with the warming center this year, so we would also allocate what they would have gotten in a match out of these funds too. So they get what we would usually give them plus what they would usually get in matching funds um, from the hoop campaign. Um, bunker gear, for those that don't know what that is, that's just the firefighters actual suits that they would wear into a fire. So the gear you usually see on a fire, pants, coats, hats. Um, there's $50,000 uh, suggested for the Park County Ho Housing Coalition. Um, that would go to them, one, to cover some staff costs for the year and also to put towards their um, housing assessment, housing needs assessment. Um, I think we could leave it up to them and how exactly they wanted to allocate it, but I think they could absolutely use that and that would be a good, good one-time use of money is to help with that. Um, the state building is what we'll talk about in the other resolution item, um, but that is very helpful in accomplishing several of the city strategic plans. Um, there's a purchase of it. You'd obviously have to furnish it and there'd be some upgrades required to make it uh, easily usable by the city, but they're actually fairly insignificant because of the design. Um, the clean air shelter, which we've talked about, this would fund that. Um, we would replace our canine unit. Uh, you, uh, uh, Rhino's our new canine officer uh, that replaced Bobby. This would also replace his vehicle. Um, that's a cost that we're going to have to spend anyway. It's just an opportunity to um, prevent us from having to pull it out of future budgets. Uh, a fence dog park is one of the current um, priorities for the Parks and Trails Board. Uh, so this could um, offset some or all the cost of that, depending on how they set it up. Um, we have an opportunity to change our website provider. Uh, one of the big advantages of the new provider is that their websites are ADA compliant which means that they only use certain types of fonts, they only use certain types of colors. All pictures have to have subtext so that they can um, be read to people that are visually impaired. And we would also be able to um, have a process. The, the website provider is also the company that currently um, publishes our city ordinances online. They also have a process where they would go through our entire ordinance, check it for gender neutrality, and then provide us with a resolution that we could pass to change all of that throughout the entire code. 
Um, so that's another unique opportunity that I think this, we could one, get a better website and then that was ADA compliant and also combine that with improvements to the code that could be done by a contractor that wouldn't fall on staff. Um, the automatic gate for the recycling center, um, a, a big concern for the community and I think the commission has reflected this to me as well is it would like extended hours at the recycling center. Um, the automatic gate meets that need because we can put that on a timer and we don't, need scenario, don't necessarily need staff um, to be there while it's open. So that would allow us to open the recycling center longer hours to the community, which I think is uh, something that's desirable in several levels. Um, the building department vehicle replacement, they just have an older truck that needs to be replaced. So that's an opportunity to do that. Um, cleaner kits, a few meetings ago when we were still in fire season, I brought you an article from, uh, I think it was the University of Montana that had a professor that had developed um, super cheap, um, portable clean air kits that people could put in their home. So while we are looking at the clean air shelter, this would also be a secondary um, method for people to obtain clean air, especially those in the age of COVID that are, are worried about going to a congregate shelter. They could get these, check out these kits from the health department or wherever they ended up being um, and use them in their home. Um, <laughs> to clean the air in their bedroom or whatever room they decide. So, uh, and they're, and a thousand dollars would actually get us quite a few of those because I think they're coming in between 40 and $50 a unit. Um, so that would be something we could look at. It includes uh, repairs to the um, pedestrian path, the along highway 10 there. Uh, we got some pictures. It's got some fairly big potholes into it. So that's the next section that we could repair. Um, the Star Road facility, um, that is the one that's on Star Road. Uh, it flooded, not this winter, but the winter prior, I believe, maybe one more before that. <coughs> so it's currently unusable. However, we're running out of storage space in our archive, which is located in the Shane Center. And a couple weeks ago, we had the second water leak into our archives in the Shane Center. Um, we lost a lot of documents on the first one several years ago, and now we lost a few more documents in this one. So this would just give us some basic repairs to the building so that we could use it as one, as our archives um, that would be um, not subject to, to flooding. And additionally, it would allow some extra storage for the court because uh, the city court is running short on storage as well. Um, the solar array for the state building, and when we're talking about the building, I actually have the, a bid from a company that believes they could generate almost 100% of the electrical needs for the building with a, um, a pretty sizable solar array on top of the building because of how it's located. So that also meets several of our environmental um, objectives. Uh, this is again bunker gear, but this is for the reserves, um, reserve fire department or reserve fire uh, fighters as well. Uh, this would get us a second police vehicle. Again, that would basically um, cover costs that we're gonna have to spend in the near future anyway, but we get care of them as one time, um, time money. Second, do we have park improvements? Um, that would be coordinated through REC and the, um, the park and trails board. Uh, but some of the suggestions have been either new uh, playground equipment or repairs to Pom Pompeii's pillar um, uh, that is in cur currently in need of some repairs. So it would probably go a long ways to sprucing up sec to we have parked a little bit. Um, wellness center, after we receive feedback both from the community and from um, potential donors to that project, we need to update some of our designs so we can put that back out to the public uh, to have them relook at it uh, as we reimagine it. And so we set aside some funds to update that as well as what the operational cost would be for the alterations in that design. Um, this is a fun one, I think, and an interesting one. So the city uh, a couple of years ago was deeded the small building right next to Mark's in and out uh, by Northwestern Energy. Uh, right now that building is empty and unused. Uh, we could actually look at knocking that building down and turning that area into a parking area for the park across the street and for Mark's. Um, a lot of the residents in that area um, consistently have problems with finding places to park because of the such high volume of traffic for Marks, um, as well as it's becoming sort of a safety hazard for people to try and back out of Marks onto Park Street with the amount of traffic that we have there. So this would solve a couple of those problems by providing some uh, very close kind of a pocket parking lot for um, Marks in and out, as well as easy access to the park across the street. The floating islands are, um, as we went through the growth policy process, one of the major things that came back is people were worried about water quality and our natural water resources. Uh, the lagoon right now is a great feature. I mean, it's great, but it isn't actually very good habitat for fish. Um, 
it's very high nitrogen levels and they do, don't do well there. Uh, the floating islands would actually be a way to help clean up the water and make it better habitat for fish in that area. And we can um, kind of improve our waterways in that area, um, hopefully to the point where um, it would be fairly clean and, and we could keep a, a, a healthier um, fish stock in the lagoon. Uh, ADA pedestrian and bike crossings. I got an email today from the Active Transportation Coalition, but I didn't have time to go through it yet. I'd ask them to give us recommendations for um, signaled crossings for Park Street or Highway 10, uh, areas that they thought flashing beacons could go in and um, significantly improve the safety of either pedestrian, bicycle, or other crossings in those areas. Uh, this would get us several of those units and we'd be able to put them in several locations along Park or 10th. Um, the tree board is already uh, presented to you in the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, this would be matching funds for a grant where they could come up with a plan uh, for the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, the BID downtown improvements, uh, while I'm not sure exactly what they would do, I know that that could go towards things like uh, the trash cans, the benches, other improvements that we've been wanting to do in the downtown area, uh, but it would give them the freedom to come up with some of those projects or they might have better ideas for ways to spruce up the downtown uh, to bring in some, some more, more tourism or to just make it a more pleasant experience for the residents as well. And then the Civic Center Acoustics, I just included on here because we had talked about bringing it back before you. So I just wanted you to know that it's still out there. Um, but I think we are making headway moving, moving forward with designs for the Wellness Center. So I'm not sure how, how much we wanna look at that. So that kind of gives you the, sorry for the long-winded explanation, but I wanted to make sure you knew what each of the items were. Um, and kind of give you a background on it. So I am available for questions. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, just, I do have a quick clarifying point before we open it to public comment. And I think we have someone waiting. Um, so this is our wish list. This is not an absolute. We're not making a decision tonight to fund each and every one of these to this absolute level. Is that true or could you clarify that for the um, public and the commission? So I'm not sure we have to make a decision on all of these items, but it would be, um, <laughs> I think it would be advantageous to make a decision on the ones that we're absolutely sure we'd like to go forward on because trying to expend these funds within the time constraints that we have is going to be challenging. I mean, it doesn't, I, I suppose I don't get a lot of sympathy in how hard it is to spend money, but um, we do need to make sure that we keep on the on the timelines or this money will will not be available. So I think if there's items that we absolutely want to move forward with that you just authorize those items. Um, and then if there's items that you want more information on or uh, ones that you may not think are worth the money, uh, then we can we can remove those items from the list. Uh, and that way I can start executing what the commission is ready to do and then we can decide when we want to make decisions on the rest of it. Okay, let's first open it. I do have some questions and maybe a, a bit of concern just on that, just for as far as the timeline, but um, we'll ask those after we open it for public comment. So we have Jonathan waiting and go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, um, Jonathan Hedinger, 519 West Park Street. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about this um, as I've been commenting on it as it as the we've uh, at every point throughout this that I think that um, it's really exciting to see how many projects there are on there that can help people and I think it's really great to spend money on um, the housing coalition I thank you for um, listening to the community and wanting to do that and I think that it's really great to give money to the warming center and I think it's really great to do the Emerald Ash Borer. And I think that a lot of these things are really worthwhile projects. Um, I did want to raise a concern about the city purchasing an office building um, with basically over a million dollars between the purchase price, the amount of money that is going into the, um, to, to, furnish it and then also and just all the expenses related to that. I think that um, as Mr. Cardo said earlier this year, the city hasn't been impacted um, financially as much uh, by the pandemic as a lot of the citizens have and a lot of the businesses have. 
And I think that if we have all this money to help people, we should consider spending it on people and businesses and figuring out the best ways to do that. And a million dollars can go a long way toward helping people in this community and helping businesses in this community. And um, even if it's just projects like the ones that you have listed, like 15,000 for this, 11,000 for this, or even if they're all 50,000, that's 20 new exciting projects that you could fund with a million dollars that you're spending on a building. And I know that that would probably, it would benefit the city to have its own space and things like that. But I just think right now, when you have so many people in the community that are suffering from the job loss or business loss or um, getting sick and then recovering the long road to recovery with the pandemic or the social isolation, I think that that's a more, um, worthwhile thing to focus on. And then another thing about it is 210,000 of this goes toward the police department. And we've had members of the community at these meetings talking about what we would like for the police funding to go toward. And the police funding that we think that many members of the community would like is a crisis intervention person, a mental health person who can respond to incidents. And I know that the money has to be spent by June 30th, and it's a one time expense. But even if you get a seed planted and going, or you give a couple hundred thousand dollar grant to Aspen or something like that, or to just kind of help getting it going, I think that that would really help go a long way. And I think that would be a really appropriate um, thing to spend money on um, with the police department. I think that um, it's really nice to have this money. I think that it really benefits the city in lots of ways and all of those projects, um, helping out all the different boards and their wishes is really helpful. Um, and I just think that a million dollars could go a long way toward helping a lot more people. And um, I think that that's just what I wanted to weigh in on and also just with the growth policy coming out, we're just gonna need more money for our growth policy implementation. And I think that that's a good place to consider spending money as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Do we have any other public comment? Hello, uh, this is Laurel Desnick, 223 South 5th Street in Livingston. <laughs> Um, just want to be sure that the commission is aware we have a what's called a Casper survey. It should be completed. Uh, we will be going door to door throughout the county. Uh, it's a statistically significant approach to gathering information from a public health emergency, in this case, the COVID-19. Um, and it will give us a snapshot of the financial, the social, the emotional issues that have arisen since the start of the pandemic. Um, it's specifically for a real-time assessment of what's going on in the community, and the city is a very big part of that. I, I think, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a long road so far, and I think we all know that the recovery from this pandemic is going to be even longer. And there has been so much hardship to families, to business, to the self-employed, to the elderly, to the school community. And once we have a bit more information that really specifically addresses housing and transportation, um, employment, food security, I think it might give much uh, a, a very good picture of where this kind of funding uh, may need to be going. And the county is in the same boat with some CARES funding I think the, the two concerns, one is that the money does need to be spent, but the other is that we don't know that any more is coming. And so we want to spend wisely. It would be great if we could collaborate as much as possible on things that really will help us to sort of build our way out of this um, very, very hard times for many, many people. And that survey information should be available um, to all of us by the end of November. 
and that's uh, again a statistically significant sample that includes the city and the county on these issues in particular. Great, thank you, Laurel. Okay, any other public comment? Hi, this is Becca Frucht at 125 South 8th. Um, I don't have a ton to say, I just like, I echo kind of what Laurel and Jonathan said, just being intentional about this windfall of extra funds to benefit the most vulnerable folks in our community. And I think some of these projects um, kind of tick that box and maybe others would be, it would behoove us to think um, kind of deeply about, are they really, are we really utilizing these funds to shore up our community the best way possible knowing like Dr. Desnick said that we have a long road to recovery. Um, and so, you know, I think the other thing too that I would echo that Jonathan brought up about the funding for um, the police department and considering that there's been a lot of conversations about that um, that we've had here um, in the city council setting and with public hearing, um, you know, are, are y'all being responsive to some of the things that have been brought up in particular about, about police funding? Um, you know, I think it's wonderful that we have this opportunity to actually um, get, like have, have money to spend at a time when that is like uh, such a privilege. Um, and I just want us to keep, um, have the most vulnerable communities as our compass when that, um, and to be super intentional about it. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Any other public comment? Oh, I see someone's waiting and to get into the chat. Josh Morris, go ahead. Hey, uh, Josh Morris here, 515 South 13th Street. Um, I just wanted to weigh in on the warming center. I was really happy to see it on the list. Um, and compared to the other items on the list, the cost is relatively low. Um, I personally worked there last winter for a few months and uh, it, it was one, it was a special place. Um, I mean, I saw it change lives. It, uh, you know, there were, there were people ranging from 20 years old to 65 years old that were homeless here in our community. And um, the impact that was made on those people by just the staff members alone was huge. When I first went into it, I kind of thought of the warming center as, you know, what it is, a warm place for people to get out of the weather and uh, recover for the night. But in reality, I found out it was so much deeper than that. It was the, the personal interaction and the, these people were at their most vulnerable. I mean, to, for them to walk into a shelter, I talked to a lot of them about how did that feel, you know, like um, dignity, pride. And they were like, it was, it's terrible. You know, it's a terrible experience. So to be there and on the other side of that and see that and see the compassion that, you know, their fellow homeless um, people have for them and the staff members and the volunteers, it, it opened my eyes for sure. Um, since then, I've, I have worked with HRDC for a while and did the housing counselor job. I was helping people get on their feet and get well established and, you know, try to figure out a path for them. And I was finding out that all these people need is a place to go and an inn, you know, one foot in the door for them to hear about the warming center. There's people six months later that are now in a house or doing whatever they see fit, you know, but they're, they're making progress in life because someone gave them the chance. Um, it was, it was, like I said, it was, it was a life-changing experience just to, to have the privilege to work there and be there. And then with COVID on top of all of this, um, as I was transitioning out of my job there, I, I became friends with the homeless community in Livingston and I've seen it grow pretty exponentially with uh, like the economic crisis that's happening with all of COVID. Um, you know, I was concerned and I voiced concerns at HRDC about how, it, how is this season going to go? I mean, with social distancing, our occupancy levels are going to drop. And I think the demand is definitely going to be there. Um, the last two years, I know we're kind of like pilot starter years for the warming center. But I think this year, I'm, you know, personally projecting that it'll be a full year. I think there'll be a lot of traffic through there. 
And like I said, it's one of the few things that can truly impact someone's life just in one night. Um, so I think the small amount that that's being discussed is it can make a huge impact. Um, but that's all I wanted to say. I sent you guys an email about it as well. So hopefully you guys got that and have the time to read over that. But uh, thanks again for considering helping fund the warming center. It's, it's a special place. Thank you, Josh. Next, I, we have Sabina Strauss. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is actually on the next resolution. You're on mute, Darrell. Yep, sorry. Um, thank you. We will wait then for your uh, question then, okay? Yes, um, thank you. Yep, and Bard, and then Sarah. Bard, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, yes, hi, my name is Barb Oldershaw, uh, 514 North G Street. And I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Park County Housing Coalition, which is a collaborative project between HRDC and Park County Community Foundation. Uh, as some of you know, we're already uh, moving ahead with starting a housing needs assessment for Park County and uh, creating a housing working group to review that assessment and come up with our proposed strategies. And I just wanted to uh, make a few comments about the timing of possible funding for a Livingston housing plan. Um, if we have confirmation sooner rather than later that the funding is gonna be happening, then that means we can build out our existing work plan to include that additional deep dive that we're gonna to wanna to do into Livingston. Um, but if we, don't, if, it, if we don't hear about the funding for another few months, then that means it might take some time to uh, schedule in that additional work. And given the increasing press of housing needs, everything we've seen even just in the past few months when this idea got proposed in um, definitely in the past six months from when we launched the housing coalition, uh, I just think that this is a project that would definitely benefit from being completed sooner rather than later. So. We are great, very grateful that you're considering funding this project. And just to say that uh, funding received in the near future will help us uh, get it in the works and get a completed plan to you that much sooner. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Barb. Um, next we have, what did I say? Sarah, go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thanks for this platform and this engagement. Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety around this time and I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I think that uh, the list really provides such a, um, a broad scope of different projects that I've you know, heard come up in other meetings. And so taking all those into consideration, um, I just uh, commend you for that. And also um, from a parks and trails perspective, the impact on our recreational spaces and the importance that these areas have really shown um, of being valued to our citizens um, of all ages and that accessibility. Um, we've seen a lot of increase. Um, and, oops, sorry. And um, I just, you know, I just think that that's not going to get any, it's not going to get any um, easier or there's not going to be less impact. I think we're going to see more growth, especially as we see our, um, our Zoom town, boom town grow and, and really establish. Um, so thinking, thinking more about how we stay ahead of that and making sure that these spaces are safe for everybody. Um, so I'm really glad to see, um, see all that. Um, I do, I do think that um, and I question a, around if, if everybody and the stakeholders and organizations and everybody knows that this kind of funding may be available to be really clever around having our 
having the biggest impact we can have towards community members, towards the people that this is going to affect the most. Um, you know, I think about winter and I think about people getting cold and I think about people getting sick and not being able to pay utility expenses or that their, their housing isn't energy efficient enough. And, you know, is there something that we can do to help buffer that gap of utility expenses and making a choice between, you know, food bills and, um, and utility expenses or healthcare bills. And, um, you know, with winter, I think we're just going to see this get harder. And I think we're going to see things that are really uncertain. So it was nice to hear um, other people kind of highlight this and the importance of the warming center and, and really understanding our community with data and surveys and, and engaging there. So I just want to reiterate that. Um, you know, I, I also wonder, could some of this money go towards implementing growth policy um, goals and objectives. It's, a, you know, reading over that draft, there's a lot of heavy lifting. And I just wonder, you know, where's the staff support and, and research and even materials or labor and additional grant writing or the marketing communication or even the administration um, or support to boards and, and committees and organizations to align us all in this, this vision that we're developing together. Um, so I just, yeah, I just want to kind of propose and, you know, what are the things that who are the people that aren't at this table? Who are the people that need to be informed that maybe this opportunity exists? And what are the impacts, the biggest impacts that we can have um, looking towards June? And I know that's close, but maybe we can have a pocket of projects where we need to spend the money quickly, but we can, um, we can also really think about what are the creative ways that we can really achieve a common vision together and address the people in need the most. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next, we have Marshall. Go ahead, Marshall. You're on mute, Marshall. Thanks. So yeah, this is Marshall Sorengin, uh, 409 and a half South 13th Street, and uh, I'm on the tree board. And um, yeah, I'd just like to second a lot of what's been said about uh, the importance of spending this funding. And um, just give a quick uh, voice of support for this 15,000 for Emerald Ash 4. So this is uh, the required cash match um, for the city to access the maximum uh, $15,000 grant from DNRC for a program for replacing ash trees that are in poor health in communities in Montana that have a high percentage of ash trees. And um, so the city would be working with property owners uh, to replace ash trees that are in poor health with more um, diverse trees. And given the, the kind of looming issue of ash borer and the city's relatively small um, tree budget and the fact that, you know, using this uh, CARES money would allow us to kind of get more additional grant funding, I think it would be money well spent. All right, Marshall. And then next we have Dan. Dan Babcock, 921 East Lewis Street. Um, so I guess I, I definitely agree with everybody on the importance of uh, spending this money um, correctly, being it's one-time money, not uh, consistent income. But I think we the council should really look at the fact that uh, when it comes to the state building um, that you're proposing to buy um, that will centralize a lot of the uh, services in one location as well as uh, if, if there's extra room being able to rent that out and, and make some money off of it um, or expand services to some sort. Um, additionally, while Dr. Desnick is correct in the long-term uh, recovery of COVID is, is certainly something we need to plan for, we're still in the middle of COVID. So our first line uh, responders need to be protected. And uh, we've had a, a large outcry both nationwide and even here locally about police and the body cams would go a long way to proving uh, and holding accountable if there is truly anything going wrong in, with any uh, conduct. The, uh, but the first responders that are gonna be going to these houses uh, that are with people that uh, could be or are infected with COVID, um, they need the gear to do the job. And I know uh, if they're anything like my fire department, there's 
all of the gear has a shelf life. And in order to uh, replace that gear, one time money is really a good time to do that because it gives you anywhere from 10 to 15 years to continue to budget for the next round of that replacement gear. Um, whether it be uh, SCBAs or turnouts, uh, they all have to be replaced by a certain date. And this would be a great way to spend that money for the first line responders. There's a couple of dozen things there on, on uh, Mike Cardos's list. I think they're all noble causes to invest in, but I think some of them uh, can be held off for a little bit. And let's take care of the people uh, who are, are serving our community every single day with the safety things that they need to do their job and continue to serve the city long after the money's gone. That's all I have. Thank you, Dan. Next, we have Joseph. Go ahead, Joseph. Hi, thank you. Um, Joseph Wellington, 105 North C Street. Some really good things proposed, Housing Coalition, the Warming Center, for example, funding those things. Um, there's some things that I'm really concerned about why they're getting so much funding in this, uh, in this out of this uh, share of money. Um, I work as a contact tracer for the Park County Health Department and I wanna emphasize that I am by no means speaking on behalf of the department right now, but uh, in that work, um, I've learned a lot about, uh, I don't know, about how this community is struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic, both economically and, and in terms of public health. Um, and I think there's a lot more to learn. Um, I think the thing I wanna emphasize is that people really are struggling in this community. Um, uh, let's see here. A lot of the people that I talk to, you know, when I'm, when I'm tracing contacts are we're, we're working class people, people who don't have the privilege of working from home. Um, and when I ask those people to quarantine, uh, you know, people who have been exposed to somebody, um, a lot of times I'm asking them to go without a paycheck for a couple of weeks. Um, and they're always like, well, can you, can you pay my, can you, can the health department pay my paycheck? And the answer of course is no. And I think that's a, that's a huge failure like on the federal and the state level to, of like taking care of its people. Um, but here we have a chunk of federal money, um, which I would like to see being used to address the, the real struggles that people are facing and trying to make ends meet during this time. At the same time, a lot of those people are, are being pressed on the other side and that um, people who can afford to in this country have, have moved to our area and to all over this state in record numbers. Um, and we're seeing, you know, it's just, just worse than the housing crisis that we've already had. So they're being squeezed on that side. Um, seeing housing costs go up, uh, shortage of housing. It's just getting much and much worse during the pandemic. Um, and so again, while, while I see some really good things proposed here, I'm very concerned that I see very little aimed at addressing the crisis faced by poor and working class people in the community. Um, and it disturbs me, for example, that this proposal allocates as much money for a fenced in dog park as it does for addressing the housing crisis. Um, and that it allocates more than twice as much for buying new police cars. Um, so I'd really like us to the city to reconsider its priorities here um, and to use this sort of windfall of money to help the people who are really struggling in our community in whatever whatever way that, you know, whatever shape that takes. Uh, that's the end of my comment. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, I have, oh, that is all for now. All right, for public comment. Anyone else that was missed that didn't or wasn't able to put it in the chat? Actually, Carrie, Carrie, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Carrie Kale, and I live at 702 East Lewis Street. Um, I would like to um, just 
thank everyone for, for being here this evening. And I do agree with uh, several of the comments made already. I think that with this windfall of money that the city has, we really do need to think about the people who have been so negatively affected um, by the COVID crisis. Um, the thought of potentially bringing in more rapid testing um, to the community so that people can be more rapidly tested if they have symptoms of COVID. Um, you think about taking away 14 days of pay to the, to the average person in this town, and it, it's a huge deal um, as staff and small businesses get affected um, and they have to close their business or certain parts of their business for up to two weeks is a big deal. And so to be able to use some of that money to help support those people, whether it be citizens or the business owners, I think would be um, a, a, a good thing to think about and look at, you know, really supporting our health department so that we have the testing and the testing facilities that we need and that we can get tested more quickly, um, I think is, is, is incredibly important. Um, I'd also like to, to, to kind of bounce off of what Jonathan said about a social worker for our police department um, to, to start a program like Portland has, which is an emergency um, emergency mental health team that goes out to actually talk with folks who are having a mental health emergency instead of sending the police could be a very good thing for our community. Montana has one of the biggest suicide rates in the country for us, and especially now during COVID, to be able to help those folks during those mental emergencies in a kinder, gentler, more effective way than sending the police, I think would be um, an important place to spend some of that money. You certainly could use some seed money to get that, to get that program started. Um, thank you for, for listening tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we do need to take just a moment to extend the meeting. We're at our three hour mark. Um, do you have a motion uh, to extend the meeting from the commission? I move we extend. I second. I have a motion by maybe, um, second by all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We'll move on. Um, let me double check the chat here. No other public comment that I see at this time. Um, let's move on to, okay, <laughs> just hold on. It just popped up, hold on. Um, we do have one last comment, go ahead. Do we have Sabina? Were you going to say something on during now or during this public comment time? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to ask um, if the commission sees, sees it fit to not to allocate the money to the um, uh, AMSC building. I represent a potential buyer who would be interested in purchasing the building um, and then I'm curious, what would be the protocol if the city wanted to lease that building from that buyer? And I don't know if this is a good time for this question. Do I need to take this up out of this meeting or what's the protocol for that conversation? Um, well, really at this time, that is a question that's more directed to the last um, item that we will cover tonight. Uh, and potentially that would, might be a question to go outside of this meeting. I, I guess we'll have to look at it as we move into that um, resolution, okay? Um, but as far as the overall list, that's really where we're focused right now versus the details of the, the sale of the building. But thank you. We can thank talk you. to them, okay? Um, so moving on. Commissioners, we're going to move on to commissioner comments and questions on uh, our our lists. So, CARES Act revenue funding options. Hey, Chair Hoagland, I just it's another ninety minute mark, so I don't know if you want to take five before we do that, or if you want to do this first. 
Yeah, I think we should take five. That's a good idea. All right, go ahead. Folks leading that call actually said that no, it probably would not be enough for Livingston. So I just wanted to clarify it with Barb because it sounds like what they're saying is if we could contribute money, then when they did the housing needs assessment, we would get something closer to a housing action plan like we talked about at a previous meeting, uh, the commission. Um, and so I think without investing money, they said that we would probably need to go off on our own and invest more money to get something we could use as a city at the detail we needed it. Um, but it sounds like what Barb is saying, and I just wanna clarify if she's still on, like that this money potentially could get us the kind of document that could be useful for our community. Is that correct? Can I go ahead and start speaking? Dura, I'll give you a thumbs up. Go ahead, Barb. Thank you. So uh, the project that we got funding for to this point is looking countywide. So it's a two-step process, one step being doing an assessment to really understand the scope of the problem. And then the second step saying, what are the potential strategies that we can use and which of those make the most sense given the particular needs that we've identified. So I think the L city of Livingston needs are a portion, a slice of the pie of the Park County housing needs. Uh, so we will be surfacing some of the information about Livingston in our Park County assessment. The biggest difference is going to be around the action plan. And that's simply because, uh, and Melissa, you know, we've talked about this before at the um, Housing Coalition meetings that as an incorporated city, Livingston definitely has a lot more levers and strategies that can be used. So um, we can't uh, because we're because our existing funding is to come up with a plan that will apply to the entirety of the of Park County. In all fairness to those funders, we can't just focus on Livingston specific strategies. Uh, but in order to get effective strategies for Livingston, absolutely, we need to be looking at the particular set of tools that you have, given that you're an incorporated city. And it sounds like what you're saying is that the money helps, the money would help get us something that we could use more specifically also for Livingston. Yes, absolutely. So Brian and I have, we have our work plan in place for the Park County version of the assessment and the housing working group to come up with Park County strategies. And we've already been talking about if we're gonna do something more for Livingston, uh, the various ways that we would uh, build out the work that we're doing. Uh, one of the really significant differences I think we'll be looking at is that we definitely wanna have more um, opportunities for community engagement in the city of Livingston, because as I know other people have mentioned, uh, actually maybe I'm confusing this with last night's meeting, they're sort of blurring together, that one of the um, one of the luxuries, if you will, that we have in Livingston is we do have a very engaged citizenry that has a lot of uh, opinions and ideas and passion to participate in these kinds of meetings. So we are planning uh, for the countywide version, we are planning some component of public engagement, but um, definitely for the city of Livingston version, we would want to really build that out quite a bit. And that is something that does take staff time to set up, uh, time to do the, um, get the information out there so people know that it's happening, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Um, yep, thank you. So I just, I really wanted to draw attention to that, that without the funding, I don't think we're going to get, because this has come up at previous meetings with the commission, um, you know, what would the coalition be capable of? And it sounds like without funding, we're probably not gonna get something that's super helpful to us. I mean, I'm, I think it's going to be helpful for the county, but in terms of what Barb already said about Livingston specific and having some extra tools because we are a municipality. Um, I think that that would be something that we should seriously consider. Um, because it fits in with the growth policy. 
those meetings, it's very clear that the people that are coming together at these coalition meetings are really aware of what's happening across the region and specifically within Montana, like across Montana communities, how drastically and quickly the housing climate is shifting um, generally, but also specifically this year. So I think, I think that it could be really smart for us as commissioners to consider this investment um, sooner rather than later before the opportunity is passed. Um, so that's one that really jumps out to me. Another thing that we didn't talk about, somebody else already, the, the citizens, the folks on the call, thank you. They already brought up the social worker. That's something that we've talked about repeatedly. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about recently, but we've talked about in the past was the revolving loan fund. So I know at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, Michael will remember, I'm sure we did something different where the, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it now, but it's the, it's the revolving loan fund that's available for businesses. We sort of changed the framework around that so that businesses that were in crisis because of COVID could apply for um, monies through the revolving loan fund to help offset some of the hits that they've been taking during the pandemic. So I wonder, and this you know gets to what Warren was saying, there needs to be a structure that's fair and equitable. We already have something like that that exists in our community. Um, I wonder if there's a way we could invest more money and expand what's available to these businesses through something like that that already exists and is already equitable and already has people working and knowing what the needs are of our community. So that's an option that's not on the list that I think we might consider. Um, and I think that's all the really big stuff that jumps out at me. I do want to just reiterate again that the air quality monitors that were purchased is not what we approved. It was something different. And um, I do think that it's important for if we're talking about the clean air shelter and clean air kits that we are really working closely with the health department because I know the clean air kits he's talking about, they came from Climate Smart Missoula, which is um, with a partnership with Missoula County Health Department. And I don't know because I'm not a health public health expert if that meets the needs of the vulnerable people or not. Um, so I think that's why it's critical to really partner with the health department and get their input before we make any decisions on air quality monitoring or, um, or um, the resiliency to, you know, periods of time when the air is dirty. Um, I also want to make sure, because I don't know if people will stay on the call, that I thank everybody for their comments. I think we got some awesome feedback and we have a compassionate community. Um, and I was super excited to hear what Dr. Desnick had to say about the CASPER survey. I think that's going to be really useful and a good reason to keep talking about the CARES Act funding. Um, because if we can get some real time data just within a couple of commission meetings that's actually signif statistically significant, I think that could really be helpful as we're making decisions um, to benefit the people that live here. So thank you everybody for your comments. And I'm in favor of what you already suggested, Jarrell, to keep this like as sort of a, a topic that we have regularly on the agenda. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now from me. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, other commissioners, anyone else? I'd just like to ask um, a question um, regarding possibly um, expediting certain items on, on the list that uh, that are timely, um, is it possible to do, uh, rather than wait uh, two weeks for another commission meeting, is it possible for a, uh, a work session to, uh, to at least get some of these in the, uh, in the going? Michael? Um, so a work session wouldn't actually um, be the way to go because you can't make any decisions during a work session, but you could hold a special meeting. And also there's nothing that's preventing you from uh, this evening 
authorizing the ones that you would want me to go forward with. Um, I've identified four that I think are either timely uh, because they need the, the, the people need them right now, or we need to continue with a current project, or we have the possibility of getting reimbursed for with more CARES Act funds, which means we'd spend it, get all or a portion of it back, and then have that money available again. Um, so if you just wanted to do those four items or a subset of those four items or however many items you wanted to do this evening, you could certainly do that and we could move forward with those if there's a clear consensus on what you would like to do. And can you state those four again, Michael, for everyone? Um, it would be the 22,000. Oh, hey, Terrell. Quentin, Quentin, hold on. Yeah. He's answering something. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so the four would be the, the 22,000 for the warming center. So both, both halves of that it would be the 50,000 for the Park County Ho Housing Coalition uh, so that they can change their statement of work and we can get a good product out of that. It would be the ADA compliant website because if we spend that prior to December 31st, I think we can get at least a portion of that refunded again through CARES Act money and have that available again. And then the wellness center architect so we can continue to move forward with that project because that's a long-term project. Uh, that we really don't want a whole lot of delays in. So it'd just be those four, that's a total of 102,000 for those four items. And could I ask about one other item? Uh, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the other item on the agenda, uh, the, uh, the building, the items, uh, the building and the items associated with it, um, if, would that have to join those four in order for us to uh, to vote on that? Uh, or, or is the vote uh, separate from tabling this list? Could we still vote on, on the building is the question. Yes, because that's, that's already in the agenda as a separate resolution. Um, we'll do that next. And so you can have the opportunity to vote on that. Uh, if you table all of this, approve some of it, no matter what you do with the, this item, you'll still have the opportunity to vote on that uh, as, as the next item. Thank you. So, Darrell? Okay. Go ahead, Quentin. Okay. Yeah, um, that I was going to suggest that um, we um, make a motion to approve the four items that Michael has presented us with um, tonight and uh, to pick those off, to, you know, get started. Um, he listed exactly what I was going to propose um, uh, to make a motion on. So um, whenever you're ready, I'm ready <laughs> to move forward with that. All right, thanks. Um, I do want to, we want to kind of wrap up just our final con parts of the conversation so we can move forward because we do have one more agenda item. I haven't really spoken too much just on a few things I, I would like to state. Um, you know, I do want us to put on this list the uh, like the crisis so social worker and how it, Melissa already brought it up, but this has been an ongoing um, request from the commission and the community on um, what could that position look like? Where would it uh, fit in? Um, is it in coordination with another entity like with the county or, you know, whatever. We haven't gotten to that place of what does the position look like or what is possible, but we do need to have that on the list um, because it is an important priority for our community. Um, another thing is I want to make a statement, I think, on priorities. Um, you know, having kind of been very active in the commi commission world for a number of years now and seven years and then um, multiple boards or community boards before that, um, what I've learned is priorities are relative. You know, what's important to one person isn't always the same importance to another. But what I really like about this list is that it's very diverse and it, it really does honor the work and the commitment and the, um, the priorities of our community. And so, for example, you know, a fenced and someone brought up the fenced dog park 
why is that a priority? You know, um, I just do want to state that I think the recreation and the local recreation that you don't have to drive to and you don't have to have a car where you can get on your bike or you can walk your dog really does accommodate a huge part of our population and that having that fence dog park has been a priority and a request of our community for years way before me and I've been on the park trails for seven years and so I know it is a priority I know that it's something that's important that and I think that it relates to COVID in the sense that recreation has changed just go to the park I'll go to Sacagawea around 5 30. it's like it's like going through Los Angeles there's so many people and it's awesome because people are out and COVID has made us go outside so we can talk to people without having our masks on on occasion, you know? Um, so like I said, I just believe that priorities do are relative. I think this list is very good at reflecting our community's um, priorities. Do I think every single one should be exactly what it is? No, but we're gonna all work through that. And I might not get my way on everything, but um, I think it's a great start and I appreciate it. And I, I agree with moving the warming center, the housing and the wellness um, center work forward um, because I think those are important issues that are timely. And I'm extremely excited to see the warming center move forward. Weather's changing quickly. Um, anyone, before we move on. Yes, go ahead, Melissa. We, we talked at the last, oh my gosh, it was a strategic plan meeting early COVID or pre-COVID about, um, we actually talked about the wellness center and how we hadn't had an update on it. So I'm really feeling like we need an update before we're spending any more money on something because we haven't had a thorough update on the wellness center. Um, so maybe that would be something to put on an agenda before we're voting on funding for it. Um, that's my thoughts. I'm not, I'm not eager to spend money on something that I, when we haven't had that thorough update yet. So I'm not sure what that looks like or what other folks think, but, um, there's a lot of questions around it still. And it's like folks have already said, it's a lot of money. So. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I don't know if that means we could like vote on the items separately rather than lumping all four of them together. Well, yeah, or if a motion is made where all four move forward or um, Michael, do you think that just because, you know, we haven't had a lot of information on the wellness center and uh, just recently because of other issues in our in our work, but is there any way by next meeting to just have a wellness center update and maybe in an action item and including our list as part of that and how we budget or move this forward? Could we do that at the next meeting? Would that um, be possible time-wise? Um, I think we're just going to reschedule the meetings that we already had set up for you um, with the presentation uh, that got canceled because of the, the COVID problem. Um, we're just going to reschedule those uh, probably for next week or the, or the following week. I'm not sure. We have to get in touch with the consultant still. But the plan is just to reschedule those as we had planned prior. So then we could have it on the next agenda and then have just that item as one of the talking points on the next agenda we could action. or any other and in any other items that you want to look at at that time okay i'm okay with that too melissa i think it's a good point um so are we ready to just move forward the recommendation to the city or to the man city manager for um for approval yeah you want a motion can I yeah. ask one question or make one comment, I should yeah. say? 
the vast majority of what's on the list is uh, is really uh, well thought out and timely. The only two things that seem to be coming up are the wellness center and the um, civic center acoustics. Uh, as far as a common questioning, uh, would it be possible to vote on the list with those two items uh, removed? So I think, Warren, I think where we're going to go with it from, if, if I, I'm correct, and please clarify anyone else that wants to jump in, uh, commissioners or city, uh, we're going to move forward on three items only as far as recommending that we move for or direct the staff to move these for, uh, issues forward for funding. And then the rest of it will go on to our work working document and working um, meeting times, working through mm -hmm. the for funding in the future. Am I correct mm -hmm. guys in saying it that way? Okay. So we're, I, I think the motion has to be made and approved by everyone, but um, we would have the warming center, the right. funding, the housing, and then the action um, plan, housing action. What I'm missing something. Can I, you click ADA compliance? The the ADA, there you go. I didn't write it down. So, yes, I have it next to it. Sorry. ADA um, compliant website, and we will have those on them or in the motion and then the rest everything else is just continuing on into future meetings starting at the next meeting mm -hmm. okay Correct. all right are you Can ready I for motion yes we're ready for a okay. motion i'll make a motion that we approve twenty two thousand dollars for the warming center fifty thousand dollars for the park county housing coalition towards the park county and livingston housing assessment and action plan and $15,000 for the ADA compliant website and gender neutral code. Second. We have a motion by Newt and a second by maybe. Roll call, please. Chair Hogland? Yes. yes. Commissioner Schwartz? Four. Commissioner Freeman? Four. Commissioner Maybe? Four. Commissioner Newt? Four. Hey, last item. Um, moving on to our last resolution, we have resolution 4929, a resolution of the city commission of the city of Livingston, Montana, authorizing the city manager to sign a buy and sell agreement with David Amps for the purchase of his building located at 20 or 220 East Clark or Park Street in Livingston, Mr. Cardus. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this particular item, I think, is a unique opportunity for the city and the community. Um, I will be the first to admit that borings are, or buildings are boring. Like, it's not exciting to buy a building, right? Like, that's not something that everybody's like, ooh, we bought a building. Um, but this particular building, because of how it's situated, I think meets a lot of needs of the community and lets us, gives us more flexibility in future years um, for I think the priorities that the community is talking about tonight. Um, and I think that that comes into the difference between the one time funding and the perpetual savings we'll realize by taking this kind of action. Um, so I'll go through some of the things in the strategic plan and why I think this is a, a good idea for now. Um, one, one of the things that we've always tried to do and we've been looking for opportunities to do is to really consolidate city services. Um, we're pretty spread out across the city right now. Um, if you want a building permit, you have to go to the public works, but then you have to pay for it at finance. And then if you need something from the city attorney, you have to come to the city county building. Um, so it's just not a good layout for service to the community. Uh, this would allow us to put the city manager um, and my administrative assistant, Faith, which would be great to have us, her in the same building as me. That would be wonderful. Um, the city attorney's office, the building and planning department, um, the finance department, uh, and human resources all in the same building. Um, so it's, it's more convenient for the community from that aspect. Um, there are some significant advantage to the way that's laid out as far as not having isolated offices um, around town. 
where as far as security and safety goes, it's much better to have everyone in a consolidated place than to have isolated pockets out around the town. Um, it also solves a problem for city capacity that we've been looking for other solutions for and haven't been able to find one yet. I.e., not only do we get the space for the people that move into the new building, where they're um, vacating is space for those departments to expand. So that gives expansion capability to um, the police department. Uh, a good example of that is if we hire a social worker or a team of social workers, right now there's absolutely nowhere to put them. Uh, we have no space whatsoever. But if we take the city attorney and the, and the city manager out of the building, then they could reside here with the police department. So if we're gonna do those kind of expansions, vacating offices gives us added capability in those areas. Same thing in public works, um, it give public works room to expand, it give rec room to expand, and then the building itself would give building and planning and finance room to expand if we needed. So it solves several problems from that aspect. Um, from an energy consumption standpoint, uh, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity because of where it's situated, the roof line. Um, we have a bid where the contractor believes that the uh, solar array they could put on the building would provide 100% of the electrical need for the building, which is, uh, which is pretty good. Um, I don't know how much, if we could put anything back on the net as far as net metering goes, but it is it would tick off another thing that I think is important to people and that's to make the city more uh, energy neutral or at least carbon neutral by having a solar array for, for that building. Um, and this is where it kind of gets into the, the short term versus long term. This type of spending is one time. We'll spend it on whatever we spend it on, that's it. We don't have anything going into the future. Um, right now, we're spending about twenty-five dollars to $26,000 a year on the lease for the finance office. Um, that's perpetual, and it's not going down anytime soon. Um, in fact, it will probably go up at some point. That will be a annual savings in the general fund. What that means is, if the commission so decided to put it towards, say, a, a mental health worker for the police department, that would cover almost half the salary every year. It's not a one-time thing. It's a perpetual savings that can go towards whatever priority the commission decides on um, in all the out years. Uh, so that I think in and of itself is a huge, it frees up a, a lot of um, $25,000 in the general fund annually is, is quite a bit, especially if you're looking for payroll, uh, payroll type savings uh, that could definitely goes for a part-time person, but could go towards a full-time person if we found other funding as well. So I think that's a, a great advantage of spending this money now to save money every year in the future. Um, the last piece is a little more complicated and not as sure, but I think it's it's a creative way to try and bring more services back to the city of Livingston. Um, Child and Family Services still has a presence in that building uh, and we wouldn't need the entire footprint currently. Uh, and what we would try to do is keep them in that space so that the state services are still there, but we could also then um, incentivize them to bring back more services to Livingston by giving them reductions in rent, um, providing space for them at no cost. Um, it might give us the ability to coax them into bringing back more services. I think the initial, and I've had some initial conversations um, with DPHS on this, but it would be bringing back um, the Office of Public Assistance on a part-time basis. Um, if we could give them give them some office space and then possibly reduce the rent for child and family services. It's a creative way to leverage that new building to bring back much needed services to the community. So when we looked at this, it, it, it granted it's boring, it's, it's administration, it's the part of, of running the city that isn't very exciting, but I think we can really leverage it to bring, um, to, to give the general fund greater resources and greater flexibility that the commission can decide how we spend those and also to leverage uh, to bring back some much needed services to the community. Um, if you uh, if you look at all of those items, I think it's a really great um, purchase. It also has parking, which is a, a nice added bonus. Uh, people can actually park there. Uh, and so it's it's really, I think, a great opportunity to spend money now to free up money in the future for other priorities. And, and that's why I would recommend it to you even now. I mean, it's obvious that there's other interest in the building now, um, the the real estate market isn't isn't going down. Uh, the offer right now is twenty five thousand below the asking price, uh, which 
I think it's a fair offer. I wouldn't say it's a deal, but I think it's absolutely fair compared to the comps that we pulled for it. Um, it really is, if we're gonna make this kind of decision, now is the time to make it just because the city is not quite as busy during the winter months, at least the administrative staff we're talking about. Um, so we could get a move accomplished before we got into the busy summer months. Um, it also would actually, we've looked at upgrading the, um, the HVAC system to include uh, a UV treatment. So we could actually treat a large percentage of uh, bacteria and virus that would go through the, um, the HVAC system, which I think is a safety issue, obviously for staff, but also for the community when they uh, would come into the building. So those are some of the ways we're trying to to really make this a useful purchase for the entire community. Um, and even some of those, I think, um, disadvantaged or most at risk uh, residents that we, we've been referencing, I think being able to expand the services for them is something important. And I agree that that's something we should be looking to do with the money. This probably isn't exactly how people were thinking that would work, but I think it does not only service them now, but gives us the ability to look at other options in the future. Um, I do have some pictures. I can show you neat pictures of the, uh, the solar array if you want to see it. I have a nice website that shows all that information. Um, we have pictures of all that, but I will hold there and see if you have any questions as we move forward. Can I, Michael, I'm going to ask just one clarifying question before we open it up. Um, you were talking about cost savings and listing. Just was, is there any cost savings as far as moving from a lot of our office space? Not a lot, but some of it from the city county building because we're moving most of the city workers out of there, except for, of course, police um, and fire. Uh, is there any cost savings that would come with that? Uh, there what might be a there could be a little, um, really, uh, since police, dispatch, and fire will all remain in the building, um, they will probably expand into the three offices that the city attorney and myself are vacating. Uh, but we may give the West Room back to the county if we don't, because that's where we usually hold staff meetings. And we would probably hold the community room for now, our portion of it. But if the county was interested in that, we could relook at the agreement and re recalculate the square footage um, and see um, if we would change some, I don't, there would be some savings there, but I'm not sure it would be uh, significant. Okay, great, thank you. Let's open it to public comment. Um, I think I see Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sarah Stans, 217 South E Street. And um, I think it's a, you know, it's always a great opportunity to consolidate. And, um, you know, I agree with, you know, but, um, providing cost savings and also expanding um, the opportunity for offering some of those social services um, to be implemented back into the community. I do wonder with the current um, uh, results of the election, if, that social services will be funded from a state level. Um, and then I think, uh, I also just really wanna um, commend the city for integrating you know, HVAC systems and thinking about COVID and then also um, implementing a solar array. Not only does it create long-term cost um, savings um, on, you know, that can be allocated for other things, but I think it also really sets a precedent for the community and kind of where our values are and, and as a leadership and adopting renewable energy. I think my only question would be that if we're gonna spend, you know, the million dollars or the 1.2 or 1.5 or whatever it is with free furnishings and everything, is there an opportunity to expand and invest um, on the current public works building um, and consolidate out there? And would it be a, you know, a, a, maybe a, a reduced capital outlay? Um, because I do understand Cardos and saying that, you know, it's a sinking cost having our um, financial entity that's sitting there on B Street um, and that's not an owned asset. So that's my only, my only question, if there's another way to think outside the box to achieve all these things that are being put on the table. Thanks very much. 
Michael, do you have any um, thoughts? I think that's a good question. It, just to answer those concerns. And I've heard that from other people. Of, are we utilizing our other spaces? Is it, have we looked to considering, you know, expanding that area or that building um, instead of buying a different one? So I will say that we've looked at several areas to try and come up with um, better solutions. We've looked at the Star Road facility. We've looked at public works. We've looked at the Civic Center. Uh, we've gone so far as to see what it would cost to put a second floor on the current city county building um, to see if that would uh, serve our office space needs. Um, but what it really comes down to is building, even if it's an addition, costs more than purchasing. Um, and that particular, and I think this is probably something that people don't realize because it's the way it's built. That the state building on, on Park Street, the 220 East Park Street is over 8,000 square feet. It is a, is a very significant um, building with 22 offices. Uh, so there's a lot of room in there for current, not only current staff, but it would cover our expansion needs a long ways into the future. Um, we, there's really just not a lot of places to go out at Public Works because of the transfer station, the, uh, the fire and rescue training center, the water reclamation facility. Um, it's pretty hemmed in and it would, it would be a significant cost to, um, to try and add on to that building. I mean, we've looked at trying to remodel the balcony area in the civic center, if we could turn that into office space um, so, to see if we could put more people into where finance is currently at. And really, really right now we are, we are at capacity as far as staff goes. We don't have a, um, we don't have a spare office. Uh, so any expansion um, is tough. In fact, uh, I'm, you know, if you look at poor Matthew got stuffed in the corner of a, of a room with, I think they're sharing four. Yeah. Yeah. There's four people sharing one office space. Uh, so it's, it's already pretty tight. Thank you, Michael. Um, other comments, I think I jump up. Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, Jonathan Henninger, 519 West Park Street. Um, I think that Sarah's idea of expanding um, the facility out at Bennett Street sounds like a good idea to explore. Um, I have serious, I, I just a million dollars is a lot of money and I just don't think it, I think that's um, adding a few offices out to that building, I don't think would cost a million dollars. Um, Another, another thing that I wanted to bring up was um, this office building, according to the Berkshire Hathaway uh, website, has been on the market for 809 days. Um, I think that that means it's probably doesn't have too much interest. And um, I, I know that there's potentially another buyer here, but um, it's $975,000. And um, that's a lot of money for an office building, and I don't think there's that many people investing in office buildings uh, at a time when we're moving toward more and more telework, and you can't really go into offices. Um, another issue that I wanted to bring up was um, I think that the state will likely not be expanding services in the next few years um, because they've cut them in recent years. And I just don't think that um, the, the new administration is gonna be investing heavily in expansion of social services. Um, and another issue um, is, I think that a $25,000 perpetual savings is really great, but I'm not sure that a $25,000 perpetual savings will go into helping people. And I think that a million dollars in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a recession, is going to go a lot farther toward helping people than $25,000 that will, I think, pretty quickly get um, allocated, uh, maybe allocated a few times over. And um, I just think that if you have all this money right now, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a recession, 
it's um, might be more beneficial to think about um, investing in people and businesses in this community. And if you, I mean, maybe you could spend $250,000 expanding the public works building. I really think that would probably do quite a bit. I mean, I think you could add quite a bit of square footage out there. I don't think it would cost a million dollars to expand that building in a substantial way. So thank you. Um, and thank you for all the um, support on the w decision on all the other CARES Act funding. I think that that's great. And thank you for listening to the community. I really appreciate it and thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I don't see anyone else in line in the chat. Is that public comment that um, someone would like to say just without putting your name in the chat? Any public comment? Hey, Darrell, this is Michelle Ibaraga, 7-Eleven, Rock Cleveland Drive. Um, sorry, I couldn't get to the chat box. Um, just wanted to, you know, just wanted to quickly say that um, I also have pretty significant concerns about uh, spending a million dollars on a new building. Um, it feels uh, like something that I don't think has been uh, a community priority, and so I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around how. Uh, the million dollars of CARES funds is uh, promoting the welfare of the community. Um, I, I do think there are quite a few really important priorities that were, were listed here um, that I think the, the commission should continue to consider priorities. Uh, again, that are investing back in businesses and people here in our community. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, we do have Sabina. Go ahead, Sabina. Good evening. Thank you, Sabina Strauss um, from Gardner. Uh, and I'm sorry, I've been kind of popping in and out, but I wasn't quite clear of the protocol. Um, basically, I represent um, a potential buyer that may be interested in that building. And so I was tasked to find out if the city decides to not purchase it for itself, what would be the protocol of uh, possibly having the city um, lease the building from the buyer I represent? Is that something that we can talk about now? If you decide not to spend the 900, the 950,000, or is that, do I then uh, take it out with Mr. Cardo's or how does that work? Michael, can you? And or Courtney, please answer that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, leasing that building actually cuts out all the benefit to the city. Um, we don't have annual savings at that point. Um, it, we wouldn't invest in a solar panel for a building we don't own. Um, we have no no way to negotiate with the state to uh, save them um, uh, office space. It, it really leasing it is is not a, a really viable option for the city. We're already leasing a space. We can continue to lease it. Um, it committing to a long-term annual cost uh, is not nearly as attractive as eliminating long-term annual costs. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael, and say, thank you, Sabina. I think I was muted. Um, let me double check for public comment. Looks like there's no other public comment, so let's move on to commissioners. Commissioner, questions, comments. We shall have a resolution on the books. <laughs> we probably need a few comments before we throw it there, Mel. Um, Let's go, come on. <laughs> any, any questions or comments, commissioners? I can go if I can kick us off again. Or I can kick us off if you'd like. It's up to you, Chair. Okay, I'll do what? it. What? I'll take it oh. off of you, Melissa, since you're usually the one starting. Um, 
So a couple questions. Uh, it goes back to one of our major issues for a number of years, and that's parking that we have talked about. Um, can you discuss uh, staff parking? My concern is that, I mean, there is parking, but that would fill up pretty quickly for just community members coming in. Um, can you discuss parking and the issue of parking with this property, with especially staff? Sure, so there's 22 spots out front, which is actually pretty good parking um, out there. But we'd actually look at um, renting some space behind the building. There's an empty lot back there uh, so that staff would, would not take up uh, citizen customer parking. Um, we haven't done that yet, obviously, because we're not in the building, but that would be the plan would be to secure parking outside of um, the parking lot so that uh, so we would not fill it up with staff. It would be available for citizens. All right, great. Thank you. Um, another. Oh, another statement I think I have is location wise. What I do like about the location is that it is central location. A lot of people can walk to it. I do have concerns with um, the way we are spread out currently. And this has been on our uh, plates for a long time about dealing with the actual physical spaces of our build, of our offices and for the city offices in particular. Um, and then having them all spread out from the rec rec department and then some of the staff being at the civic center all the way out to the public works to um, the middle of town with the city uh, county building we are spread out and that is not easy for community to address issues and get things done in a um, easy way i do like i said i do like the central location um, which Historically, if you think about it, post office and, and city county buildings should be in the center of town, so they are accessible to the communities. And I like the location being close um, to the downtown area. Um, you addressed some of the cost saving questions I had. Um, I do see this, you know, it, it's a big purchase, but I, if I didn't have years of history of knowing that we have, this has been a long time issue. I would have even more concerns. I mean, the money is a big concern. And I'm, as one of the commissioners said, or not commissioner, sorry, community members said, um, is this a priority on how we should actually spend our um, COVID monies? Um, and, and can we, or should we be looking at reinvesting it into um, people and, and to the physical needs of our community members? And so that it's a tough, tough question, tough call. But um, I also know a lot of the issues we've dealt with in the past, and this might be, a, you know, this is one time money. I don't see us getting a bunch of COVID money in the future just from, um, from very, for various reasons from, um, as we all know that who knows where funding is gonna come from in the future and how much of it, especially with COVID. Um, so this might be a good balance of a lot of the problems and, and balancing and, and solutions that we can use um, to solve some problems. Um, uh, let me see. Um, I, another issue, just a last one for me before others I hope to hear from in the commission. Um, you know, the, I am still concerned with the, the price and especially the number of days, and I have already expressed this to Michael, the number of days it has been on the market, um, how long it's been on that, I mean, Normally when you make an offer on a home, you start at a price, you offer and you might counter and it goes back and forth and there's some negotiating time. So I'm wondering if, if that's potential, there's some potential in that. Um, Cause I feel like it's a little high 
Um, and I, I, you know, I might be the only one who thinks that, but I feel like the price is a little high. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Open it to others. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, Melissa, you only? Okay. If you want, I, I can, Quentin, you can go first and I'll go after you. That's fine with me if it's okay with uh, Okay. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just going to kind of make it short. Um, first, I want to address um, Jonathan's question about um, public works out there. There's, um, I don't know how you would expand out there and um, hate to be ignorant right now, but um, I'm not sure what the cost of per uh, square foot um, construction is going for um, commercial wise right now. But you know, looking at this building as a whole, it works out to about $120 a square foot. And I, I definitely know you can't build anything at that price, you know, um, and having the land as well and the infrastructure and, and stuff like that. Um, and I've been out of public works, um, especially when they had the finance offices out there, it, it's just, it's cramped. Um, there's just no room out there. Um, I don't know if you could expand up on top of that building. Um, I don't know enough about it. Um, but to me, it just doesn't seem practical. And um, having our city offices in the heart of our city, um, I think is very important um, as well. Um, let's look at this building and it, it needs a lot of need. Um, as Terrell said, um, we've, uh, this has been a long time coming. The only reason why we're looking at it now is because we have this one-time money. Otherwise, obviously, I don't think we would um, be doing anything with it right now. Um, with that, I'll yield. Thank you. Thank you, or thank you, Quentin. Uh, Melissa, go ahead. Thank you. So I'm really, you know, I really, I hear everything that, um, Michael is saying about the benefits. So I'm, I'm really trying to think of this property critically like I would if I was investing my own, not just like our collective money as a community, but my own, like making a, you know, when you think about buying a house in Livingston for your own family. So I'm just gonna be really honest with everything that I've seen so far. We commissioners got comps um, the two most expensive comps on the list, I just wanted to point out, I don't think should be included because one's outside of city limits and the other one's in zoning that wouldn't allow for government buildings anyway. And those are the two most expensive comps on the list. So when I think about comparing prices, for me, Darrell, that shifts down what the value of this building probably is if you're using the comparative analysis. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And then, I mean, there's so much to say and so much has already been said from the community and from other commissioners. So I guess what I would add is um, the building itself is expensive and we have to acknowledge that there's more expenses on top of that. Apparently also a parking lot. What, um, can you, before I forget, Michael, could you tell us what it costs to rent a parking lot? And I wonder if Faith could do like, um, you know, like the Google Earth so we can see where the parking lot is, like the top down map view. Cause I'm not familiar with the parking lot in that area. And then I'll finish my comments. Oh, good. So this is the building. This is the parking lot that is out front, the 22 spots. This is the area that we're looking at. We obviously wouldn't need the entire thing, uh, but we could negotiate for some spaces back here for staff. 
Do you have a guesstimate at what the going rate for parking rental is? Just curious, thinking about. I'm just curious. Um, I think World Fire uh, rents some spaces back there. I think they play, pay like $720 a year for six spots, something like that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is I think that building is huge. Um, it is huge. You're right. It, it doesn't necessarily look that big, but it's very, very big. Um, and there's like 22 offices and I think not all the staff goes there. So I'm just trying to get my head around how many staff would move in there. I think is it around nine people, Michael, that would move into that office from other places? Uh, it's gonna be more than nine. I think it's about 12 or 13. Oh, 12 or 13? Uh, 14, I think, 14. Oh, okay. I was and we would rent out five of them. So it'd be 14 out of the 17 offices. So there's 22 offices. So you would um, use 14 for city and then you said rent out like about five and then the other ones would just be used for like your storage documents all the extra stuff that comes along with human resources and planning etc i'm no offense to those departments i'm just assuming they come along with documents um okay that's helpful i guess um so some things in mind i would like to see when we're talking about buying properties the city using a buyer's agent to make sure that we're getting a really good price. Um, and, you know, thinking about how we're gonna pay for the inspection because I think that's part of it. I also, if we're talking about renting office spaces, I would like to know if we have proof that it's a viable rental property because it sounds like it's not being rented out at max capacity. So that would be good um, information to have for an investment like this where we're banking on needing to rent some of the spaces. And um, it sounds like we can't, I think it's, I think it's safe to assume that we shouldn't just count on a large investment in social services with the change in administration at the state level. Um, so those are a couple things that could be, I think could be really helpful we're talking about a property at this price, um, just for due diligence before making a decision. That's the biggest stuff on my mind that hasn't been named so far. Thank you, Chair Hoagland. Um, thank you, Melissa. Just, so we are working with an agent, correct, Michael? Mm -hmm. So I can address a few of those questions. We, we don't have a buyer's agent because I can't negotiate. Um, I don't have any authority to negotiate on your behalf. So what you have tonight is not an offer the city made, it's an offer the seller made. Um, so if we accepted it, he's, the seller has already said that this is acceptable to them. Um, so we can't actually work with an agent unless you authorize me up to a certain amount to spend uh, because I have no authority to, to negotiate on your behalf. Obviously, if you authorize me up to a maximum to spend, that's gonna be in a public meeting and it'll be known to the other party, um, which is part of the problem of, of negotiating as, as a public entity. Uh, it's a little harder. Um, as far as the uh, rental space goes, um, the, there's actually a couple renters in there right now and there's actually a couple more that have uh, asked um, to rent some space, but they're holding off right now to see if we buy it or not. Um, we, we should, uh, DPHS is going to should maintain the, the same level of presence that they have now, uh, which would take up most of that wing. Um, and I think they are paying somewhere in the neighborhood of 3000 a month uh, right now for the three or four offices that they're renting. So we're looking at, at probably another twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year in rent from the state if they stayed at the current level. Um, and the third question was on the inspection. Um, we're fortunate in that aspect that we have a building department and our building department has already done the inspection on it. Um, and they were able to uh, look in the attic, the crawl space through the entire structure and found it sound. So 
uh, we don't need to worry about an inspection in this case. All right, thank you. Um, Lessa, do you feel those questions were answered? I mean, I heard what he said. Uh, I heard his answers, but I, um, I still have reservations about uh, coming in at a price that high for a building that's been on the market for well over two years. Um, I do believe that real estate is hot in Livingston. I don't think that these are the kinds of properties that are going um, like hotcakes. I think it's residential. So um, yeah. All right, thank, are you done or? Do you wanna say anything else, Melissa? I'm done. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, commissioners, other commissioners. Uh, just uh, having nitpicked the, uh, the list of other items, um, looking at this building or having looked at this building, uh, I would say that it's, almost entirely a win-win situation. Um, when you, when you uh, consider the cost of building uh, something from the ground up, uh, I don't know what the square foot uh, cost is either of, uh, of new construction, but uh, I'm sure it's, it's, a, it's a lot more than what Quentin said, 20 or $21 a square foot. Um, and this, this is totally a time and opportunity timing thing. Um, if, I, I don't know if it's, if it's heavily overpriced or not, I kind of doubt it. If you look at Zillow and, uh, and look at the price or the price increases of real estate um, in the area, it's phenomenal. Um, at some point, somebody is is going to not think twice uh, about buying that building. But the real fact is the the uh, benefits um, of doing it now. Uh, it, it's an almost ideal situation for its location, for its um, um, condition, and for the options and possibilities of what you can do with it. Uh, uh, Jill and I own a, an office building downtown, and we are constantly getting calls for office space. And in almost all cases, it's for one and two person offices. So restricting yourself to government, I, I don't know what the city, uh, what types of offices they could bring out to, but every, pretty much everybody in ours are, are uh, are their professionals. And I think that demand uh, is constant and it's gonna get uh, more so. So I don't think unrented offices is gonna be a problem at all. Um, again, if, if you if you wanna look, the, the, the current situation is, is uh, really bad, but if you wanna think two or three years past this, um, would, with taking this money, putting it into this building, would that have caused that many problems in the city? Um, and I kind of think it doesn't. So to me, the, uh, the building is an opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. All right, um, Mel, do you have anything? You know, I, as soon as I uh, saw that building, it's perfect. We have some homes on my block that are, uh, cost that much for, for a single house. So in today's market with that building being a, for business use, it's unbelievable. Um, and it's relatively new, you know, it's not that old a building. And, and it's just a perfect, uh, perfect fit what we have to do. But a lot of people don't understand that we have people scattered all over town and in, in offices and uh, bringing everybody together is a huge thing. And this building allows us to do that. Plus we are making money on the building at the same time. So 
um, the opportunity is there, the money is there, and I think you have to make a mind up, you know, what you want to do. And it, I think today's it's a perfect, uh, perfect situation for us. So um, I think it's great. Plus the parking and all that too. I mean, there's a lot of uh, other advantages. So that's where I am. I think it's it's good. And then we'll address these other issues later on as far as what you do with money. And uh, that was our first look at it. And I think uh, we'll refine it in the future. But this whole deal is exciting, you know, that we're doing right now. So I'm pretty thrilled for it. And I think it's a good deal. And we've got good people right now to work with. That's it. All right, thank you. Um, so we're at sort of the end of the conversation, unless any commissioners have last questions um, or comments. Um, I do have one and I still go back to the price, I feel because the need for improvements, et cetera. And um, Michael, you referred to, you know, authorize up to a certain amount. Um, I feel more comfortable proposing what we would like to offer or authorize um, up to an amount um, versus uh, just the seller. So I want to make sure that that is kosher. And uh, I mean, I would like to authorize less than than 950 which is what is on our list and it's partly for the improvements and the need for updates and etc and um you know looking at some of the costs that will have to be invested if, i mean if it was all prime like perfect yeah the higher cost would be more comfortable to me but there are some pretty major needs with updates um, so like, how do we potentially, or how do I, I guess, because it's me talking, how do I move something like that? If I want to propose, um, authorizing a lower amount. Um, I think the cleanest way to do it would probably be to have someone, um, motion to approve the current resolution and then amend it, um, or replace it either way. Um, that would probably be the easiest way to do it um, because that way it's taken care of under the current resolution, which is on the uh, agenda. Um, Shannon did send me some information just to, so that I can share it with you. We built the, uh, the building out at the transfer station. Um, the cost of construction out there for a 50 by 100, 100 building with one office was just under $600,000. And that was one office and parking. So that's what that's what new construction is costing up there right now. Um, but as far as your question goes, I would move on the, the resolution and then replace or amend it. Courtney, do you have anything to add on that? Or can you put the amendment into the resolution? So make a motion to approve. I'm just kind of laying it out. Um, approve authorizing blank amount on resolution number 4929. Courtney, clarify. Please. Let me give you some direction, but also let me offer something up that, um, that Mike hasn't said for me. Um, he's really good about doing that most of the time. When we looked at this for the first time, I got together with the building and planning department and we looked very closely at everything that we thought would be an advantage to us in negotiating the price down. Were there any structural defects? Were there any issues about the roof based on um, the heating and cooling that is there that might need to be repaired or replaced. Um, and what we found was that everything was better 
than we thought it was going to be. Uh, we also got some information, um, I think just in the last couple of days that they've had a reappraisal and that reappraisal is significantly above what their asking price is. Do you have willing to release that at this time, but um, we have a, a good understanding that it's at least at least three hundred thousand dollars higher than what their asking price is. Hmm. Who has this reappraisal? The owners. Hmm. Okay. So as for process, if you if you want to amend, um, you can approve the resolution and ask that the city manager go back um, and try to provide a counter offer. And you're gonna give him some authority to go down, but not up. Okay. So how does that sound in a motion if someone so moved? So you can move to approve resolution 4929 with the understanding that you're directing the city manager to negotiate on your behalf to see if they will take something less than the 950,000. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. I You're appreciate welcome. that. Um, all right, Commissioner, are we ready? Or anyone wanting any more conversation on? Um... No. I mean, I'll tell you, I did some math. Sure. Oh, shit. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, Mel, did you say something? was talking. <laughs> Go ahead, Melissa. Um, so I took a mean average of the comps, excluding the two that I wouldn't include because one's not in the city and the other one's zone, it's in the wrong zone. It's in a residential neighborhood. And the average cost, so I did like the math for average cost of square foot and it's $102.47 per square foot. And then I did the math for the square footage of this building. I'm just giving you a number, Jarrell. It was um, $822,629.16. Based on the comps. A square um, foot? No, for the total building. The square foot was $102.47 was the average cost of square foot for all the other comps we were offered, excluding the two. Okay. And then when you take that square footage times the square footage of this, you take that cost, excuse me, times the square footage of this building, you get the total that I said. So I'm just giving that to you because it's data. Yeah. But, um... If I might interject, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I came up with 117 a square foot for the for this current building. And you used all the, did you use all the comps that were offered, Quentin? No, no I'm just going by what, what this, what this okay. building price is out per square foot is $117 a square foot. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not looking at any comps. I, I'm not sure what the comps are. Okay. Compare, comparing apples to apples because there's not, at least in our town, there's nothing that I would find similar. I'd have to look at Bozeman or something. And I know um, that. So. Oh, thank you, Quentin. Sorry, I was. Yeah, that, no, that's okay. I just, I just want to clarify my square foot price and stuff like that. And, uh, um, you know, I don't, I never saw the comps. Um, I don't know how you could compare it with anything else in Livingston at this point. You'd have to go to Bozeman and uh, I'm sure it'd be a lot higher. That's all I had to say, thank you. So with Quentin's numbers, the total is 939,276, just to give you a number, Darrell. 
Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Well, and I, when I looked into, like my concern is, is, you know, the square footage, I still think it's a or square foot cost is, it's not horrible. I think it's the improvements and the need for improvements that you add on top of that, that then becomes my concern. Yeah. So seeing that the, the base cost or price lowered to compensate for the need of improving, but new builds can be or around about 175 to 200 square foot right now in the Bozeman area in particular, which I looked into with some people I know who do architecture, et cetera. Um, improvements to say, if you're like finishing a structure, you know, an, uh, making a, an apartment in a house that you already have or something, that's about 150. Um, so, I mean, I think this is in within a reasonable uh, place as far as the overall cost or the price. But my, like I said, I was concerned about just the need for improvements. Um, and I don't mean just this is where we want a new wall because that's our choice. It's more about there's just some, you know, there's some updates that are needed that are quite, can be quite pricey. And we've already predicted that it's at least $60,000 worth. So that was my major area of concern mm -hmm. for the price anyway. Um, so, so we're at moving forward or trying to move forward decision. Um, do we, you know, I would like to authorize uh, a slightly lower amount or up to as um, was clarified with Courtney, but I also um, am just one. So I don't, someone else wants to a motion or propose a motion and we go from that. Um, I, I'll, if you're ready for a motion, I'll make a motion to amend or within an amendment. Okay, go, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I'll make a motion to approve resolution 4929 with the uh, cost not to exceed $950,000. Can we also clarify in that motion, um, like authorizing the? Um, uh, uh, yeah, authorizing the city manager um, to negotiate down on, down from that. Okay. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Second. Um, so we have a motion by Schwartz and a second by maybe. Roll call, please. Mr. Hoagland? Yes. Commissioner Schwartz? Four. Commissioner Friedman? Four. Commissioner Maybe? Four. Commissioner News? No. Motion passed. Next on our agenda, we're moving on to city manager comments. We're way over our time, so I'm not sure what you have. I have two very quick things and one you asked for. So um, the the first one is while we did were forgiven the um, the 960,000 from the Department of Transportation, which was great news. Uh, we also got a letter from the Montana Department of Transportation, ending our agreement with them for our um, our urban route funds that were earmarked towards the the crossing project at Star Road. So that will free up our urban route funds for other projects. So that's just an update on where we are in that. That's good news. That's just moving forward. Um, the other thing you asked for was an update on the large format retail. Um, I know that was on the last, um, Matthew had gone through what they had, they had provided, the zoning commission had provided. It was on the last um, agenda with them. 
but I think again, they did not get to it on their agenda before they adjourned. So as far as I know, there was no movement on that because the zoning commission didn't um, didn't look at it during their meeting. So we're, we'll have to wait for them to look at it in their next meeting. All right. Thank you. Um, commissioner comments, Melissa. I want to first thank our community. I feel like this has been a long week and, um, you know, we started the growth policy hearings this week and then this tonight's meeting was pretty long too. And I just, I feel really so much gratitude for hearing so much compassion from our community about all these topics tonight. And I just, it's just a reminder of what a great place we live in. So I really appreciate everybody coming, even though it's been a lot of late nights for a lot of us. Um, so thank you to the people at this meeting, staff and community members. And I wanted to thank especially the zoning commission because obviously they have been doing a ton of work. We saw so much on the agenda tonight that they've been working on. And I'm really grateful for them pouring over all these topics before they come to us. And I wanted to give you all um, commissioners some insight into the meeting last night at the planning board. Um, there were some really great topics brought up from the community about the growth policy draft. And I think we have a, a very big task in front of us. Um, I'm concerned about the timeline because of some of the errors that I've already seen in the growth policy. Some just basic things like getting information incorrect, like one table, I'm just, this is off the top of my head without notes, one table that shows we have four schools in our community and the adjacent facing page shows a map with seven schools list listed. Um, another thing is like getting the internet wrong, the internet speeds in Livingston, basic things like that are gonna take time to edit and it detracts from the topics that people really care about in the growth policy that we're also going to have to sift through and listen to public comment. So I'm concerned about our timeline. Um, we'll see if we can make it or not by the end of December. I just really wanted to be transparent with you all since we gave them a very, we gave us the planning board a very tight timeline and the work is going to be plenty um, for four meetings. Um, but I wanna thank the planning board because I think it was a really good meeting and we are one member short the county appointee was never replaced. So last night we had two tie votes, which also make it challenging when we keep coming up with split decisions. Um, so that's another thing to be aware of that we're a member short on the planning board while we're doing this heavy lifting. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to rectify that, but that would be welcome. So that is all for now, I yield. Thank you, Chair Hoagland. Thank you, Melissa, that was a nice update. Um, Warren. I'd just like to uh, extend my appreciation also to the people who uh, show up at these meetings. It's uh, way more than show up at uh, in person at the, uh, the old meetings. Uh, and uh, it's, it's good to hear their opinions. Um, uh, at times I'd like to hear more specific um, um, nuts and bolts kind of way of solving a problem that they may might have in mind rather than this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a situation and we should rectify it. Uh, it, it would be good to, to hear some, uh, some approaches, uh, solid approaches to, uh, to rectifying it because I'm all for change if it's uh, in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Uh, Mel. Yes, I think uh, you, there's two things that uh, weren't figured into this price. One is the location. And we know that location is very important to a home or a business. And 22 car parking lot. So it's not just the building, it's the amenities that go with it. And it's hard to put especially downtown Livingston to find a parking lot uh, is huge. And the fact that it's a newer building 
and it's the fact that it's a great location. And uh, that is all worth I can't give you dollars and cents on it, but it's, it also makes the building more, uh, for our particular purposes, more valuable. Um, and I think it's great to hear what, what the community's thinking. When, if anybody gave us a million dollars, there'd be a lot of people that would give us a lot of ideas where to spend a million dollars. So that, that's a tough one, but I think we're doing some great stuff. And I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of good things. And, uh, and I'm, I think I'm all zoomed out. I'm ready for another, another program. So, uh, but I appreciate everybody's hard work and it's, it's good stuff. I yield. Thank you, Mel. Quinton. Yeah, I'll I'll keep it short um, as it is getting late. Um, yeah, thank you for the community participation. This is what it's all about. It means a lot, and uh, I really take to heart all the uh, comments that everybody has. Although we're never always going to agree um, 100%, but the engagement is incredible. Other than that, that's all I have for tonight. I yield. Thank you, Quentin. I just have a a positive to say about our, um, you know, some of our community growth in general, and people have been bringing um, great ideas to us regarding growth and, and planning. Um, but one of the things that we sort of forget is the major projects that have been happening that are really reflective of those ideas and those important issues, such as, you know, the old hospital now um, being affordable housing um, or and subsidized housing where needed. And, um, and then the old clinic is now being made into uh, apartments, which is, you know, infill. And I, and I think that ADUs, you know, another place where we're adding in um, housing to our community um, or some type of housing, hopefully, uh, versus just rent our vacation rentals, but those are steps towards really filling in our community instead of sprawling out. And I'm excited to see uh, that continue. Um, also, um, I'm getting a lot of feedback uh, from people just on the growth policy and the and the want for us to consider those issues. So um, I look forward to continuing that. Uh, what else? I promised my shout out, but then I didn't prepare very well. So I'm gonna have to wait again. I keep promising and not following through. I think it's because of long meetings. Um, last thing is just speaking of meetings and, and uh, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is I feel like We've had great participation and uh, we don't want that to stop. So thank you community for participating. Um, we can always work on our efficiency and I'm hoping that I can get better at making our meetings a little more efficient. And, and I'm not sure how we'll do that yet because I, I don't wanna obviously cut people off, but we do um, also work towards being more efficient with our time and with others, other people's time. So little baby steps and working through that as well. Other than that, that's all. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. This meeting of the Livingston Commission is adjourned at 1019 uh, p.m. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Nice work.